so live streaming has started yeah yes you you can see my yes yes yeah. yes okay okay I, i'll unshare it how do you unshare it you can like cut me out <laughs> i think uh, how do you unshare uh on the top of the the red button must be the red button must be there on the top there is a stop share adjusting oh, oh yeah right right yeah. Okay. Uh, Camilla, uh, can you share the screen now? Are you able to share the screen? Uh, yes. Uh, one second. We can start the recording now, right? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm starting the recording. Ah, you can start the recording. We'll wait for a couple of more minutes. A lot of people are joining. पूरी अच्छी शेल वी स्टार्ट Yeah, we can start. You already two minutes. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think let's okay. start. Yes. So Camilla, yeah. you can start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Camilla, and on behalf of Center for High Energy Physics (IIC), I welcome you all. We meet here today to discuss theoretical perspectives a decade after Higgs boson discovery, organized by CHEP. 
so uh, as you all know it has been 10 years since the historical discovery of higgs boson but the quest to understanding fundamental physics however did not end there in fact there are many questions there are always many questions for example is the higgs is the discovered higgs boson really the standard model higgs is the higgs composite in nature can higgs be a portal to the elusive dark matter and other new physics particles and uh, how does higgs boson come into the picture in relation with neutrino physics and other uh, beyond standard models uh, for example supersymmetry so uh, and of course uh, can higgs explain the inflation of the early universe and many more such questions we gather here to learn about the progress we have made so far from a theoretical point of view but of course uh, that is not all that needs to be discussed as uh, let's see beg begins the run 3 we look forward to collecting more and more data and have more precise measurements so this is an this is a really exciting time for particle physics but uh, sadly we are constrained by the short duration of this meet which is just for one day so we will not be able to cover those interesting and very important experimental aspects we hope to conduct a similar discussion on the experimental side of it too that is the current status and the development of future colliders but right now without further ado let's dive right into it and throughout the meet there will be certain rules that uh, the participants are requested to follow so i'm just reading them out so we request all to follow uh, these rules please mute your microphone while listening to the talks if you have questions in the middle of the talk drop your questions in the chat box okay the coordinators will pass the questions to the speaker in due time after the talk is finished you can raise your hand and ask questions at your turn unmute yourself only while asking question uh, please check that you have again muted yourself after asking the questions and you may turn off your camera to save the bandwidth and all the talks will be recorded and live streamed on youtube and so uh now and also uh the talks that are of 45 minutes so i will be alerting the speaker after 30 uh 5 minutes and the talk will be for 40 minutes and you'll have 5 minutes for taking questions so uh without any more delay i uh, we we will be begin the session and we shall uh begin the session with a welcome address by the chair of cgp professor justin david so i welcome him to uh share a few words and i am now stopping my screen share yeah hi everyone i mean <clears throat> i'm justin uh, let me just share the screen to begin with uh so yeah it's uh, the screen ah so i'm happy uh, this opportunity has been given to me uh, for you know for beginning this exciting conference so let me just take the time i have uh, to introduce uh, the center for high energy physics uh, which is in isc uh, we are a sort of small center compared to the other departments in isc but uh, we have an interesting history and and we have our interesting contribution so uh, the center uh, came in existence around 2004 in the present form after reorganizing the center for theoretical studies which was conducting similar uh, research programs uh, and uh, we conduct various programs in the areas of high energy physics quantum field theory and quantum gravity i will just give you a brief uh, you know, introduction to some of the things we do uh, uh, by just sharing the people who do it and what they do so um, so the major research areas are you know we have areas right from formal quantum field theory uh, to uh, to low dimensional condensed matter systems and uh, you know uh, in 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 the areas you are interested in uh, we do various standard model searches as uh, standard model physics beyond the standard model a lo lot of emphasis of our research is actually uh, of the people's research here is actually on you know precision uh, measurements in in the standard model uh, and uh, prediction of certain Uh, certain particles and of certain phenomena uh, uh, we have also recently added astrophysics uh, uh, astroparticle physics to this uh, thing uh, because that's sort of the frontier we uh, we we expect to be 
And uh, in QCD, we have also expertise in QCD. Again, it's on precision data in QCD, uh, the base transition temperatures and so on. Um, and we also have a little formal group uh, in gravity duality, string theory, and quantum gravity. And some expertise in quantum information too. Uh, so this is sort of the rough area. You get a picture uh, by just seeing the topics uh, I'm listing. And uh, let me just introduce some of the, peop the people and the research. Uh, we have 13 faculty members and an honorary professor, of course, in the audience. Uh, and uh, so here I, I, I group them into sort of uh, sort of areas. I mean, I have organized them in a particular way so that you get a perspective. Uh, so the theoretical particle physics in which I think most of the people here are running this uh, meeting. Uh, there's Anand. Uh, he does uh, chiral perturbation theory. Uh, grant uh, unification and supersymmetry. He's also involved in precision standard model, uh, I mean, uh, determination of precision parameters in the standard model. I mean, uh, G minus uh, I think he's been involved in pion uh, physics. Uh, Biplab, he does, uh, yeah, uh, this collider phenomenology, supersymmetry, and Higgs phenomenology. And he has some uh, recent work on uh, the Higgs uh, uh, phenomenology. Uh, so, uh, and Rohini, everybody knows Rohini. And, uh, so uh, she also does collider physics, Higgs phenomenology, supersymmetry. Uh, Ranjan is, uh, does astroparticle physics, uh, various uh, predictions in astroparticle physics, and Sudhir also uh, does supersymmetry, dynamic fact theories, uh, and physics beyond standard model. Uh, yeah, uh, right now I think he's in, into dark matter too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, this is uh, people I, I sort of put together who work with large collaborations. Uh, so there's Jyotsna who works with uh, the CERN collaboration, CMS collaboration at CERN. Uh, so she's also been recently, I think, uh, been involved in uh, determining uh, Higgs trilinear coupling, uh, I think that group, the CMS group. And uh, Prasad uh, works in the lax case theory. Uh, and uh, he does QCD at finite temperature, uh, basically uh, thermodynamic properties of this finite nickel potential. And uh, and these are people who work in applications of quantum field theory uh, to other systems, like Sapurva. He used to work in Lattice, but now he does mostly quantum computation and quantum information. Diptiman does low dimensional condensed matter system. And Sachin works in actually, right now he has effective models of QCD. He studies effective models of QCD, models QCD by a matrix model, <coughs> studies its parameters, studies the mass spectrum, actually. Um, and then there's this formal in theory and quantum gravity group, uh, including me. Uh, there's a recent addition we have, Gaurav Narayan, who works on quantum gravity. Uh, Chetan, uh, string theory in black holes, uh, and in India, who works in S matrix mostly now. Uh, so this is uh, us, and uh, I guess you get a perspective of what we do by this. But this, uh, we, I mean, the most importantly, actually, our, one of the jobs is teaching and men mentorship. Uh, we have eight postdoctoral fellows, uh, 39 PhD students, and uh, 11 students, roughly 11 students every year who do project with us. Uh, and, uh, and we teach courses in the ISC undergraduate program. The integrated PhD program and the regular PhD program and advice uh, uh, students uh, because we help the postdocs too. These are our mentorship duties. And uh, the other activities, uh, we run an active visitors program. Uh, presently, we have uh, Professor Sopan Chattabade, who's a particle and accelerator physics. Uh, so this is visiting professor with us. And, um, and then we host, of course, undergraduate program uh, students uh, across from across the country. And uh, just as you are part of it now, we are we conduct national uh, level uh, you know, schools and workshops. This is one of them. I mean, uh, so uh, the organizers uh, have uh, planned to have three online meetings, uh, perspectives uh, of uh, you know, after a decade after a decade a, de a decade after he goes on discovery. And you are presently like attending the theoretical perspective. Uh, uh, eventually, they plan to have the experimental perspective and future perspectives, and all this will be held before the end the year ends. And hope, uh, hopefully, the conference, I'm sure, uh, it'll be exciting and productive for all of you. Uh, welcome to, to the meeting. Here. Thank you, Professor David, for your kind and informative words.
Uh, our first talk will be presented by Professor Rohini Gorbole. And I again remind uh, you the rules uh, for the duration of the talk. So the talk will be of 45 minutes, which includes 40 minutes of talk and five minutes of taking questions. I will alert the speaker after 35 minutes. Uh, welcome, Professor Gorbole. Okay, thank you, Camila. Camelia rather, I'm sorry, too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's really nice, uh, a very informal discussion that we had of, I, I, I mean, when I suggested this, I had a thought of maybe a two and a half hour meet to celebrate the 10th anniversary. And uh, thanks to uh, Anand, Ranjan and Sudhir this has, and Biplab, uh, this has changed into a much more... Uh, uh, serious affair. So, thanks very much uh, to all of them for uh, uh, beginning to organize this. And uh, I am going to be talking about uh, the history. So, let me sh begin by sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, yes. We yeah, can. good. So, I just want to tell the early story about the Higgs boson. So my plan is uh, that I will really begin at the beginning and that I call massive W. Then the second part of begin of the beginning is the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then combination of the one and two is the famous model of leptons of uh, suggested by Steven Weinberg, which is the birth of the Higgs as we know it. And in fact, Benjamin Lee used to call it Weinberg's particle till Weinberg suggested that it be called the Higgs. So, then I will go to the Higgs properties and what we knew when the Higgs was postulated, what we did not. And then very briefly, I will tell about the theoretical bounds on the Higgs mass and the indirect bounds on the Higgs mass. Putting these two together, I will present to you the landscape on the eve of the discovery of the Higgs that is uh, 10 years ago. And as I go along, I might just weave in some of my own early involvement in the story. So the first one is my, I begin by a dedication to my PhD supervisor Jack Smith whose supervisor for his master's thesis was Peter Higgs. So this was my own earliest connection with Higgs and this is uh, Jack Smith uh, with Peter Higgs uh, in the Nobel Prize uh, ceremony as you can see the date this is in 2013 uh, at the in uh, Stockholm. I personally began my graduate studies in 1974 and this was the year when JPSI was discovered and one of the most significant, why it is called November Revolution is that this was really the first solid indication that the gauge field theoretic description of weak interactions that was suggested by Glashow, Weinberg and Salam in theory based on the minimal gauge group SU2L cross U1 was indeed a reality. And if that is the case, then the Higgs boson as a real entity began to be taken very seriously. And this is also the time when the famous Nanopolis Ellis uh, uh, Gaia paper about giving the uh, sort of picture of Higgs boson and the nuclear physics B came out. So I also would like to say that when we are celebrating 10 years of the Higgs discovery, we are celebrating more than half a century of the Higgs itself. So, let us begin at the beginning that for weak interactions, the beginning was the V-A minus theory which was put forward by Sudarshan Marshak and Feynman Gelman separately and as Weinberg puts it, V-A minus was the basis, uh, it was the key as he calls it, V-A minus was the key. So, if all of us remember that uh, the for beta decay interaction describing the nuclear beta decay around 1957, this was the Sudarshan Marshak theory which said that this can be effective, this will be described by an effective Hamiltonian which is uh, given as a current current interaction product of uh, the hydronic current with the uh, leptonic current. And the difference between the leptonic current and the hydronic current was really that in the case of leptonic current, this was just 1 minus gamma phi, the electron was always left handed, whereas here it was 1 minus mod Ca over Cv gamma phi, where this was a mod Ca over C, Cv was just a number slightly bigger than 1. 
So this was the sudarshan marshak V minus A theory. So in fact, basically not just the beta decay, but actually all the Fermi the weak interactions that were observed till then could in principle be written in terms of the product of two currents and the currents are either vector or axial vector. So just the combination of vector and axial vector current meant that you could in fact think about these point like four fermion interaction as being caused by an exchange of a spin one particle. So this actually is the beginning of thinking that the weak interactions might be thought about as being caused by the exchange of a massive spin one particle and that, that's the name the weak boson actually the name weak boson was given by Schwinger before even the V minus A theory was um, uh, put forward and in fact Sudarshan and Marshak mentioned that uh, the V minus A nature of the interaction uh, actually lends a lot of support to the idea of the weak boson a charged boson that was postulated by Schwinger in analogy with the photon that was already known. So this was the ex extension of the known QED which was I am anticip anticipating already gauge theory here and this is the photon vertex in the gauge theory and co corresponding to that Schwinger actually had postulated this uh, W boson exchange uh, causing the weak interactions and of course because it is uh, uh, supposed to be very heavy this all came in uh, uh, already in Schwinger's time and therefore the what it manifests itself at low energy is a point interaction and it is this point interaction that was indeed found by Sudarshan and Marshak and Feynman and Gelman to describe the entire the set of gamut of weak processes that was seen at that time in 1957. So this is where the W boson sort of took its life. Uh, but then one started calculating the cross sections in the V minus A theory thinking of this as a current current interaction and then the total neutrino electron cross sections get on an experiment one finds that this cross section will actually grow with energy and there is this linear rise with energy of the total cross section. So clearly the cross sections cannot keep on rising with energy infinitely like this at some energy this will actually violate unitarity and you can do a partial wave decomposition and see that the unitarity is violated when the total center of mass energy square of the center of mass energy is bigger than this number and this is really the Fermi coupling constant or the muon decay coupling constant. Now indeed once you put in a massive W then the unitarity will actually be preserved because there will be a factor of involving MW square in the denominator and therefore MW should actually be less than the energy at which unitarity is going to be violated. So therefore the first bound on the mass of the W comes from this expression which says that the W mass is not based in finite, it is finite and it is less than or equal to 300 GeV. So the idea was fine, Schwinger's W boson should be massive but the, it, it, uh, there should be a the limit on this mass already by the considerations of the unitarity. But this actually raises other problem that if you now calculate nu nu bar going to w plus w minus uh, and then you find that those amplitudes start violating uh, unitarity at uh, somewhat higher energies and that happens because of the longitudinal degrees of freedom of the w. So in fact Lasha was the first one to notice that if we think of a gauge theory based on SU2 cross U1 gauge group we can actually tame the high energy behavior of these amplitudes. So this is a different story, this was a total cross section, this is the uh, 3 level amplitude of nu nu bar going to w plus w minus and now uh, once the, the w boson have masses uh, you can, uh, uh, the, the, you can uh, if this, there is a problem and that problem will be cured if you have the extend the particle spectrum of the theory uh, based on the SU2 cross U1 gauge group. So now however this is why this is right that the gauge theory will re re remove the problem of unitarity violation in u nu bar going to w plus w minus. The massive w's caused another problem and that was you know this is a case of a tarpaulin actually and this is where the Higgs actually commit to the picture. So QED as a gauge theory by this in 19 you know already 1960s was very well understood established. And Yang and Mills had already put forward the non-abelian gauge theory idea and then one said that the, when the gauge group uh, SU12 cross U1 gauge group was a very nice gauge group as pointed out by Glashow. This was a 1961 paper. 
the gauge theory of weak interactions will not be possible because the massive gauge bosons mean that we cannot have this uh, Lagra lagrangian to satisfy the uh, any gauge symmetry and at this point nobody knew how to sort out this problem and in fact not many other than the inventors of the standard model were thinking very much about weak interactions as gauge theories at this point apart from people like glasha at the same time in the theory of strong interactions there was basically a development in understanding of symmetries and what people had seen that there were many symmetries which were approximate symmetries like isospin the flavor su3 then in fact for pure leptonic weak currents as i already pointed out cv over ca was one and for beta decay ca over cv was different than one and this very difference from one of our strong interactions was considered that uh, this is happening because of the effects of strong interaction on the actual vector cur current that the ve vector current remains un uh, unaffected by strong interactions similar to the fact that the proton charge and the electron charge and one and the same there is no renormalization uh, due to strong interactions of the vector charge and the actual vector charge is only partially conserved so it conserved so it receives small corrections and this was done due this was understood as happening due to breaking of chiral symmetry so therefore people generally started talking about how broken symmetries can be described uh, in that time goldberger and treman had proved that the ca over cv which was 1.25 this variation uh, the deviation of ca from 1 uh, was actually understood by saying that the divergence of the actual vector current was proportional to the pi on field so this was all happening in strong interaction context but then how do you understand this spontaneous breaking of the symmetry this was the idea that had been uh, floating around at that time and in fact the spontaneous symmetry breaking which you and me know as the cornerstone of the weak interaction uh, s12 cross u1 model was actually first introduced in the context of strong interactions and in fact weinberg salam and goldstone they proved a path breaking theorem in 1962 and i'm just producing lines from the abstract some proofs are presented of goldstone's conjecture that if there is a continuous symmetry transformation under which the lagrangian is invariant then either the vacuum is also invariant under the transformation or there must exist spinless particles of zero mass most of us study this in the beginning of our uh, study of uh, standard model and since at that time no spinless massless particles were known to exist this seemed to be the end of the use of spontaneous symmetry breaking in field theory but then came the genius of nambu and he actually made the whole sense uh, by pointing out that the goldberg treman relationship which was uh, uh, sort of uh, put forward and understood uh, in terms of the breaking of the chiral symmetry he said that actually the, the this could be completely understood uh, if the chiral symmetry of the strong interaction is spontaneously broken if the symmetry was an exact symmetry pi on would have been massless in accordance with the, uh, the weinberg salam and goldstone theorem but since the chiral symmetry is not actually exact we have an almost massless pi on that was the pseudo goldstone boson so fine at this point spontaneous symmetry breaking was being applied only to the theory of strong interactions and approximate symmetry of chiral symmetry was being broken spontaneously and there was the pi on is the pseudo goldstone boson now this spontaneously broken symmetry was visible in the interactions of the goldstone boson in case in this case the pi on now around the same time in another year anderson showed that in the non relativistic context including yang mills interaction the problem with zero mass goldstone excitations vanishes so now there are two possibilities one was that if it was approximate then you would have a pseudo goldstone boson so not exactly the massless uh, uh, excitation but here anderson gave a completely different perspective into spontaneous symmetry breaking saying that uh, that is the abstract from his paper it is also shown that schwinger's criterion that the vector field maths not equal to 0 implies that the matter spectrum before including the yang mills interaction contains m equal to 0 but the example of superconductivity illustrates that the physical state spectrum does not so this uh, some comments on the relationship between these ideas and the zero mass difficulty in theories with broken symmetries are given so anderson was already seized of the fact that spontaneous symmetry breaking can be used uh, uh, such that the problem of the zero mass goldstone uh, will not exist if we make the symmetry 
to be local instead of the symmetry being global as it was being thought in the context for example of chiral symmetry and then came there were two different theoretical theoretical issues i have tried to give you one which said that the local gauge invariance required massless gauge bosons the properties of the weak interactions indicated we must have massive gauge bosons now how to have massive gauge bosons and still have a lagrangian that respects gauge symmetry and that as i said with the goldstone theorem uh, weinberg uh, salam and goldstone theorem one had said that the spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry will always lead to massless scalar and this combination of ssb with a local gauge theory we combine this with a local gauge theory and we get a healthy way of getting massive gauge bosons still respecting the gauge invariance and this was the same observation by anderson and indeed this is what the standard thing which you read and study in the first lecture of uh, perhaps the uh, standard model that indeed we can start with a lagrangian which contains a complex uh, doublet uh, uh, scalar uh, then the, which contains the wrong sign for the mass term for the scalar then there is this uh, self coupling and then there is this local gauge symmetry now the physical vacuum will indeed correspond to the non zero vacuum expectation value of the scalar uh, complex scalar field y uh, by v over root 2 where v is related to the parameters of the potential in this manner and then indeed now if you uh, expand uh, around this uh, minimum then the one finds that uh, one gets the theory of a massive gauge boson uh, here there was not no mass term for the gauge boson but a mass term is generated and the mass is given by g times v where g is involved here in f mu nu and a physical scalar eta which is with the mass root 2 times mu so this was indeed the basic uh, higgs mechanism now in this example we started with a complex scalar and one massless gauge boson and after spontaneous symmetry breaking one ended up with precisely one massive gauge boson gauge boson and one massive scalar so in general the number of scalars will depend on the pattern of symmetry breaking so we do have one massless gauge boson in nature so if we want to apply it to real life something slightly more complex has to be done actually i should also point out at this point that neither of the proponents of the spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanisms there were three or four of them knew about the issue with electroweak interactions they were looking at ssb from the point of view of applying it to strong interaction so actually they did not apply this solution to the problem that actually existed he actually mentions this specifically in an interview whereas salam and weinberg were looking at ssb at the same time they were also looking at uh, the phenomenology of the weak interaction and they then imagined that this gives an absolutely wonderful way of generating the non zero mass for the w boson but that means that there will be a non trivial uh, de scalar degree of freedom and that's the higgs so this is the famous paper of model of leptons from 1967 and i would actually like to read the first few lines with to you leptons interacts only with lep photons and with the intermediate bosons these are the schwinger's bosons that presumably mediate weak interactions mind you pre presumably what could be more natural than to unite these spin one bosons into a multiplet of gauge fields standing in the way of this synthesis are the obvious differences in the masses of the photon and the intermediate meson and in their couplings we might hope to understand these differences by imagining that the spont symmetry relating the weak and electromagnetic interactions are exact symmetries of the lagrangian but are broken by the vacuum that means they are spontaneously broken and uh, he just speculates here the model may be renormalizable because the lagrangian is gauge invariant and it was this uh, sort of uh, idea that uh, they put forward and this is actually the lagrangian that he wrote for the uh, in the model of lepton's paper and indeed we have this picture standard picture that there will be three su2 gauge bosons which are massless before the spontaneous symmetry breaking there is a u1 gauge boson they mixing them they would produce the z0 and the photon and the charge current w plus and w minus which were the ones which were initially envisaged by uh, our friend uh, schwinger so glashow's paper actually had electroweak unification but he didn't have a model for the non zero masses of the weak bosons 
therefore no there was no prediction for the relations between mw and mz and clearly there was no prediction of the higgs boson so in that sense this paper really differed because this paper is not only gave a precise relationship between the w and the z masses but also said that there will be a, a scalar field which uh, will be left over after spontaneous symmetry breaking and therefore the big difference between the glashow paper and the salam weinberg paper was really the additional scalar the higgs boson because they had used the higgs mechanism to give masses to the w and the z in the gauge invariant manner so in that sense glashow uh, uh, was on one hand and uh, weinberg and salam were a step uh, step further actually weinberg went even one step further which even salam didn't take and that was that weinberg actually also used the same mechanism to give masses to the leptons so weinberg salam as i said they used the higgs mechanism to make the gauge bosons massive but remember that this was only one way of achieving it it was likely not necessarily probable that weinberg's model was right and still there is no elementary higgs so the 1967 paper as i said has discussed all this and one of the things one should remember which will be pertinent for our further discussion is that the choice of representation to which the scalar phi belonged it actually decides the couplings of the higgs bosons with the fermions and the gauge bosons so even if you granted that it was elementary what else did we know this choice of doublet was ad hoc that is first point that i want to make secondly nothing was known a priori about its mass and only thing that was very nice was that its couplings to all the gauge bosons and fermions were known thanks to the mass generation mechanism that is thanks to weinberg essentially all right so here was the story that uh, in the paper phi was chosen arbitrarily to be a complex su2 l doublet and you had this 8 uh, degrees of freedom with four massless gauge bosons four scalar degrees of freedom in the scalar potential and when you do the ssb and look in the unitary gauge you are left with three massive gauge bosons one massless gauge boson which was the photon which will of course have 11 degrees of freedom and uh, there will be one physical scalar which is the 12th degree of freedom so clearly we didn't create any new degree of freedom but they simply get described in different forms now here the first thing that i want you to emphasize here is that the ratio of mw to mz depended on two parameters one was the mixing angle mixing between the b and the w3 and the representation to which the scalar phi depended so therefore for the choice of the doublet in weinberg salam model in Sal weinberg paper in fact rho is equal to mw square over mz square cos square theta w which is 1 so what is this rho this rho also had an alternative uh, interpretation and understanding as the ratio of the charge current interactions to neutral current interactions in the effective current current lagrangians and therefore there is a independent theoretical experimental way to measure rho and then one can compare and contrast with this once you measure cos theta w and see whether this uh, doublet story actually carries weight so the weinberg's model had suggested two very one very robust prediction which i have put here as uh, in uh, bold existence of the z boson the weak neutral currents and with the relative strength of the charge and neutral current interactions we given by rho which is then predicted to be one for the choice of the doublet in addition to that there are existence of the additional scalar one single scalar but since the choice of the doublet is ad hoc the prediction that there will exist one scalar additional scalar and rho will be one both these are less robust predictions all right so this is the standard model lagrangian which was the proof you know now we we sort of make a big jump from 1967 74 to something close to 1985 when the large hadron collider was uh, being planned imagined and designed and there you see that the lagrangian was the proven gauge sector by this time you had actually proved that the electroweak uh, theory is a gauge theory then uh, interactions between fermions and the gauge bosons are described by this covariant derivative the mass masses seem to be generated by interactions of these uh, fermions with the scalar but this part was uh, not uh, established at that point and the red part the scalars 
were not at all seen and this is somewhere around 1980 that we can talk about. Now another 10 years passed, before those 10 years passed, let me just now summarize the predictions of the uh, wine in, which are present in Weinberg paper and there you see that the masses of the W and the Z are related to the couplings of the SU2L uh, uh, and U1 gauge group G1 and G2 and the vacuum expectation value V. V can be determined experimentally in terms of the muon dk constant G mu and you don't need to know mu square and lambda separately but you know V in terms of V uh, which is determined V in terms of G mu itself. Now you can go ahead and uh, say that all the masses are related to G1 and V and G2 and V and then the Lagrangian for the scalar sector also involves the lambda okay but lambda is related to mh square and v so now we have uh, please note here connection between lambda and mh so at this point all we knew was g1 g2 and v further one knew that uh, higgs is a spin zero cp even object and the couplings of the higgs with the fermions couplings of the higgs with the v gauge bosons and the self coupling of the higgs uh, as well as the coupling of the higgs with a pair of gauge bosons all these are actually given in terms of the weinberg salam model and the couplings to gg and uh, pair of photons are loop induced and those loop induced uh, couplings were uh, uh, also pretty well known but they depend now begin with this they depend on the additional particle content of the model these are uh, not determined simply by the symmetry breaking uh, and uh, principle and the gauge group so here i uh, sort of summarize the loop induced couplings that in the standard model the contribution is due to w and top loops for the h gamma gamma vertex and for the higgs gluon gluon vertex it is the top contribution new particles beyond the standard model will contribute in the loops and those contributions are actually non decoupling for chiral fermions and that's a very important point because if the if a fermion gets the mass from the higgs mechanism then it will have couplings proportional to the mass of the fermion with the higgs and then they will enter the loop and hence indirectly by looking at the higgs to gamma gamma and the higgs to glue glue couplings you would be able to probe if there are any more chiral fermions than are known so that was the idea for a higgs mass of 125 gv which is the higgs mass at which it was discovered 10 years ago the photon photon width of the higgs is actually proportional to the loop amplitude which is caused by the w and the loop amplitude caused by the top exchange and in fact it is dominated by the w contribution in fact a w is about minus 7 and a top with the mass of the top quark uh, 175 gv is about order 1 so it's really a small quantity compared to the 7 in the very very early days the top quark had not yet been discovered and it was considered to be light so in that time the for the heavier gauge, gauge bosons in fact higgs boson the dominant production mode was not ggh but was the w fusion because uh, anyway if the, the top is not heavy then uh, in the glue glue fusion of course if i calculate the same thing for the glue glue fusion w cannot contribute because glue do not carry uh, weak charge and then the top is not very heavy so, in which case the glue glue fusion production cross sections were considered to be rather small for the large Higgs masses and therefore earliest vision when uh, I was a graduate student, we thought that the dominant uh, mechanism for production of the heavier gauge Higgs boson would actually be the W fusion. So, as I said, when did people start taking uh, Higgs seriously? This was the weak neutral current discovery in 74 as well as the discovery of JPSI which made people realize that yes, SU12 cross U1 is, seems to be correct and exactly by the same time the renormalizability of the spontaneously broken gauge theories was proved by Tohoft and Weltman in 1977. So it was all coming together and people started believing that the gauge theoretic description of weak and spontaneous uh, weak interactions with spontaneous symmetry breaking seems to be the right thing. And then came this paper in 1976 which was this profile of the Higgs boson, Ailes, Gaia and Nanopolis, which I referred to in my early talk. And the situation, in the, I quote from that paper, 
situation with regard to Higgs boson is unsatisfactory. So, what they are saying here earlier is that by 1976, the gauge theoretic description of weak interaction seemed to be pretty good. Everything was described in terms of sin theta w and g1 and g2 and you could actually uh, describe all the uh, neutral current interactions, everything in terms of the standard model, but where was the Higgs boson? So, it said that this may well not exist, the symmetry may not be broken spontaneously, may be broken dynamically. Therefore, confirmation or exclusion of the existence of the Higgs boson would be an important constraint on the gauge theory model building and they said that at least right now, no way is known to calculate the mass of the Higgs boson in the context of the weinberg salam model. So, what did we know about its mass? So, you go back and remember it depended on lambda and nu square. Now, are we? Now, these are parameters of a Lagrangian and we have no idea if they are not related to any other observable, how are we going to be able to predict image? Are there any theoretical considerations? And that is where this seminal paper which by Benjamin Lee and uh, Thacker and uh, Quigg that came in, where they did is that you remember I talked about nu nu bar going to w plus w minus which was actually discussed by Glashow in a paper. Uh, now, this is actually continuation of that idea and people looked at the uh, uh, amplitudes E plus E minus going to W plus W minus and indeed what Glashow's work had shown is that nu nu bar going to W plus W minus, this has a uh, uh, bad high energy behavior, it gets cured by the Z exchange with the Z W W plus coupling exactly as predicted in the standard model in the SU2 across U1 model. But if I consider instead of nu, I consider the electron, the sum of these two amplitudes still had a residual uh, uh, bad high energy behavior which grew with the energy as the logarithm and indeed the exchange of the Higgs boson H channel spin 0 exchange actually tames that uh, bad high energy behavior of this amplitude and once you add all the three, the three amplitudes together give three diagrams together give rise to a W plus W minus E plus E minus going to W plus W minus which is not rising with energy in fact but which has a very good high energy behavior. In fact, the Thacker paper, Lee Thacker and uh, the Quick paper calculated all kinds of amplitudes in the standard model and they showed that each of these scattering amplitudes at the tree level had by bad high energy behavior, but they cancel each other the bad high energy behaviors only for the cases where the coupling of the Higgs boson and the coupling of the Z boson with the W's is exactly as in the standard model. Further, if I had heavy fermions and if I looked at TT bar going to W plus W minus, for example, then one would need the HTT coupling to be exactly the same as in the SM which I talked here about the, with the E plus E minus also. So, this was actually the discussion already of this paper that I have been discussing again and again and this first time in this paper Lee, Quigg and Thacker brought therefore predicted that there should be a upper limit on the Higgs mass of about 780 GeV. Another way of understanding the same thing is that remember the relationship between MH, lambda and V that if the MH is too large then the self coupling lambda is very large and that will that means that it will be a strong coupling uh, theory. So, if you want to have a light Higgs that is traditionally we said that it would be the weak coupling uh, theory and otherwise if the Higgs mass is too large the Higgs might be strongly interacting because lambda is actually rather large. So, actually there is a very interesting statement that I would like to make is that uh, Satish Jogrekar, uh, who was a graduate student of Benjamin Lee and also Tiktopolis Cornwall, I think uh, a whole lot of other people had actually proved that you could gen actually derive the particle content of one generation of the standard model including the Higgs boson by simply demanding the W plus W good behavior of the W plus W minus scattering amplitudes. So, this is the upper limit on the Higgs boson mass. Then they, are there any other limits? These are pure theoretical limits, right? Now, the second set of theoretical limits came from triviality and stability bounds by demanding that the quartic put coupling in the Higgs potential, as I said, this is something that existed in the original Weinberg paper. So, we are not putting any extra assumptions. 
So if you look at this potential oh, and you demand that the quartic coupling that is involved in this potential remains perturbative under uh, uh, its uh, evolution under loop corrections, then where do the loop corrections come from? This is the self coupling lambda h fourth. Now you will start uh, uh, calculating the loops and uh, then ask the question how do loops change lambda? So if you look at how loops change lambda then by demanding that uh, this uh, lambda uh, there are two conditions one is to say that uh, lambda you know just show see the form of the lambda under the loop corrections you can calculate the renormalization loop equation for your coupling lambda and uh, this lambda q square is lambda v square divided by this factor and here what i have done is that i have said that it's a uh, uh, lambda is becoming large so all the other couplings are actually neglected and only corrections are coming from the higgs uh, scalar exchange itself and now if you look at this form and ask the question that at some very high scale lambda is going to become very uh, small and at the end of it it will actually become uh, you know so there are two ways in which you want to look at it one is there are two kinds of limits uh, that you are going to get and here when you say that uh, since the, there is this uh, uh, lambda has this energy dependence and it is going to blow up at some scale the only way you can solve the problem is by saying that lambda was zero to begin with and that is then the theory would become trivial. So this is the upper bound uh, on your uh, mass of the Higgs at the uh, electronic scale by demanding that the Landau pole at which this will blow up to infinity lies below a certain energy scale. So this is the point that I already mentioned uh, before uh, on which I have written here that we say that if, ta if we demand that the lambda should remain always in the perturbative regime then uh, we have to actually uh, we are uh, we go only to the final conclusion that lambda will be zero and we don't want that so that's an alternative view we take which i already mentioned that demand that the scale at which this lambda blows up actually lies below uh, you know uh, above below a capital uh, scale lambda and then the lambda the scale at which the pole will exist is something related to v through an exponential and if I put lambda c equal to lambda equal to 10 to the 16 GeV you will find that mh should be less than 200 GeV and this is the triviality bound by saying that lambda q square actually develops a pole below 10 to the 16 GeV would me demand would mean that the Higgs mass at the low scale which is this lambda v square should be less than 200 GeV. So now this meant that if you ever find the Higgs, the mass of the Higgs will tell you immediately what is the scale of new physics beyond standard model. The other point was when mh is small and lambda not large, the fermion and the gauge boson couplings will actually contribute to the evolution of lambda. And in fact, as time went along, one started realizing that the top quark was heavier and heavier. And by the time of 1990s, you already knew that the top was uh, 175 GeV. GeV. So you could actually calculate this and then now demand you know that uh, uh, get a limit lower limit on the Higgs mass. Now I demand yes madam you have five minutes very good I am more or less coming to the end of the story. Okay. So therefore you now demand that uh, uh, at small uh, demand that the, the Higgs mass be such that uh, lambda should not become negative because lambda becoming negative is not something acceptable vacuum will become unstable and indeed you can actually do this and get yourself a lower limit on the Higgs mass and the earliest calculations of such stability bounds were actually done by Weinberg and this was a paper in 1976 by Weinberg where he said that the stability of the vacuum sets a lower bound on the Higgs boson mass and at that time since top quark was not known and he used only the uh, W contributions, the, the limit on the Higgs boson mass was something like 3.72 GeV and then he said in this case the best place to produce the Higgs boson will be in the neutrino reactions and in 1977 this is my own first paper involved in the Higgs boson where we had calculated the W boson fusion of the Higgs boson in neutrino uh, proton reactions. Now as we know the actual Higgs boson in the W fusion channel in PP and LHC has become a very big deal. So this is actually the early story about the limits on the Higgs boson mass. So these are the limits which are coming from uh, 
triviality. These are the limits coming from the vacuum stability and the Tevatron had looked actively for this in this is 2009 and one said that now depending on where the Higgs boson is found, we will say that what is the scale of the new physics. That was the situation and the task for the LHC was to find a Higgs in this very vast mass range from 70 to 1000 GeV and as I said with the mass of the top which was known at that time, initially lot of attention was focused on the VBF and that is where the some of the younger people will know about boosted jets in a big way and this idea was suggested by Butterworth and collaborators to reduce the QCD background for the heavy heat searches and many of us actually had been working on the vector boson fusion at that time that because we thought that that might be the major channel for what is called the so called intermediate uh, Higgs mass. So, you know between 1986 and 2007 a lot of water flew under the bridge and now we know much more about the Higgs mass using E plus E minus precision measurements and I am going to skip this part which is again a very interesting story but since I do not have any time I am skipping the part how precision measurements at left actually gave us the constraint on the Higgs mass but I will now come here in uh, 2011 where the searches for the Higgs boson at left had ruled out the Higgs masses up to 114 and uh, Tevatron searches had ruled out the masses between 160 and 180 and this blue region was the region that was uh, suggested for the Higgs boson from the radiative corrections that the Higgs boson mass can uh, give to the precision measured couplings in the standard model and the lab had measured this precision couplings to a great degree of accuracy. These are the four slides that I have uh, skipped and this was the situation in 2011 that one said that the Higgs boson mass the central value uh, prediction was here 100 GeV but at 2 sigma level you expected the Higgs mass to be less than something like 220 GeV. By the time you came on the eve of the Higgs boson uh, uh, discovery that is 2013, this is at uh, this is actually 2012 June at which point you know what had happened was this remains the same the blue that I have drawn here but you have whole lot of more and more experimental exclusions from lab from Tevatron add, add to that the LHC exclusion and in December 2011 frankly the only point slither that white slither that was left in the standard model was this white slither. So now how does it look on this famous plot of pure theoretical bounds because these are all experimental searches at this point these are experimental bounds this blue is combination of experimental and theoretical uh, considerations of the perturbative corrections and these are pure theoretical bounds vacuum stability as well as uh, 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 triviality and then you see this was this thin slither and now on the eve in 2012 January we found that the Higgs mass range was restricted to this very narrow range with theoretical constraints pure theoretical constraints as well as experimental and theoretical constraints and if the Higgs had not been discovered in 2012 where it would have where it has been perhaps things would have been more fun but in fact there have been much more complicated because stand if standard model was correct and its correctness was being proved to a great degree of accuracy by this studies of MW and MT we would really have been in a pickle and indeed LHC to everybody's relief found the Higgs really in that narrow slither and it gave us the final confirmation of the correctness of the model of leptons of uh, Weinberg. Now where do we go onwards? Testing the Higgs self coupling and using the Higgs to probe the BSM through the Higgs portal. That is where we are going to go and I end with my own th third slide on personal connections that the way the data were reported on July 4th, 2012. In fact, what we had found is that this was the ratio of the observed rates with respect to the expectations of the standard model. You should have had all the ratios close to 1. Whereas here we, we were finding the observed values of the ratios away from 1 and all of us at that time remember immediately started asking is this the Higgs boson 
because R should be one for uh, all channels if it is the Higgs boson. And in the same issue of physics letters B, which actually had uncovered the earliest signal uh, discovery of the 10 years ago, we also had this paper saying that the apparent excess in the Higgs to die photon rate, new physics or QCD uncertainties and our abstract really said that there are most probably it is just QCD uncertainties and I am personally very happy that it appeared on the same issue of physics let us be which had carried the announcement of the discovery of the new boson. So this is my end of my historical recollections and thank you very much for being polite and listening to me with patience. Thank you professor for the very insightful talk. So now I'll ask uh, if you have any questions, participants, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay. Okay. So uh, oh. if not, yes. So Jira is a question. Uh, no, no, I think he's clapping. Just clapping. Yeah. No. <laughs> if not, then uh, I had a question. Yes. So in the figure where you showed the part of uh, the different bounds on mm -hmm. the. Yeah. So there, uh, I think there was this lambda, which was once pi and once two pi. Okay. So, yeah. No, that's okay. I can, I, I understand what you're asking. Yeah. So I don't need to show the slide again. Right. It's okay. Sure. Or maybe I will show if other wants to, others want to understand what we are discussing. So. Let me once again share screen. See, the point was that when you start talking about, you know, you the lambda equal to pi and 2 pi, like what is the criterion of a theory becoming strongly interactive? That is the question that you want to ask. Is this theory strong interacting when coupling, self-coupling is pi, where self-coupling is 2 pi, or self-coupling is 1? So it is really asking the question uh, because you don't have very well defined uh, criteria there. You can try to define criteria perturbatively because in this regime when lambda starts becoming large, those criteria themselves are somewhat fuzzy and therefore there was an idea was that you give a very wide uh, rope to the strong coupling, to the regime where the, uh, the regimes of lambda where theory will become strongly interacting and the point you want to really see here is that even if you change it by an order of, you know, by a pretty big factor, the upper limit on the Higgs boson did not change that much. You see what I mean? That if you are yes. looking at one TeV, you know, it was of the order of 350, 400 GeV, 750 within a factor 2. And you have to realize that when you don't, you know, when you don't have any other theoretical constraint on the mass of this object, even tying it down below say like 750 GeV was already an achievement and that this achievement does not critically depend on the value of the strong coupling you use was a very important thought. Okay. 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 Uh, you, you see my point? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that was the, and the other interesting thing was that this was also indicating that uh, the triviality bound, which also, is, and also the unitarity bound, which is around 751 TeV. That, that is again assuming when you say unitarity bound, you are again assuming that there is new physics beyond 1 TeV or 10 TeV and those bounds actually lie in the, you know, these curves when extra, extended to 1 TeV lie around 300, 700, 800 GeV and the difference between them is also not too much. That is the point being made that this is a robust uh, prediction. Okay. In terms Thank of you. these ideas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Sudhir, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, when you said uh, before the discovery of the Higgs, there was only one sliver yeah. of uh, region available. Is it purely from theoretical constraints or also? Let no, no, I said joint. You see, okay. Sudhir, I made two statements. Let okay. me go back to that. And that's, okay. I thought I tried to, therefore, I presented two different plots. See, this plot, okay, is all the hatches and the crosses are from, uh, you can see the slide, right? No, 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 I think you had to share. Oh, I have not shared it. Okay, uh, that of course doesn't help. Let me share. Uh, where is it gone? Ah, oh, yeah, share screen. Yeah, can you see it now? Right. Yeah. Okay, 
no sir it's a, i mean i tried to be separated so let me once again do it ha huh? look here here if you see all the hatches and the crosses right they are all experimental okay that you looked for the higgs in this mass range you didn't find it right yeah. because the profile was fixed by the standard model you knew the couplings you knew the qcd corrections so in the framework of the standard model a higgs in this mass range up to here was ruled out and beyond here was also ruled out now overlaid on that is this blue band the blue band is a combination of the precision measurements at left and the theoretical predictions of the couplings of the fermions with the z and the w in theory so this is a combination of experiment and theory the blue band right yeah and this band is pure experiment okay yeah. now then go then i wanted to contrast this thin slither with this which is a plot actually which i presented in a conference talk in uh, december 2011 where here these are pure theoretical bounds which i had shown from the 2009 paper this these two black lines and these two low vac vacuum stability bounds okay and then the lhc had ruled out this entire red region lhc had also this was also experimentally ruled out and then you are left with this slither from theoretical considerations now this is from pure theoretical considerations okay so yeah. what one is saying is that this thin slither and this thin slither actually overlapped okay so that was a great deal of relief right right yeah that from pure theoretical considerations what we thought was still allowed was also still allowed by experiments but if experiments close this if lhc first run finally in uh, july 2012 would have also re removed this slither then we would have had trouble because then we would have brought this down all the way right and that would have then said that standard model is simply not consistent right that is really the point i wanted to make and that's why i made these two plots separate okay 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 uh siddharth has a question maybe if it's a quick question we can address it right now otherwise uh we have to continue it later because we are short on time so siddharth uh, Yeah, yeah, just a quick question. So, uh, uh, the way the two experiments uh, excluded the re uh, regions for the Higgs mass. So, is it coincidence that the two experiments, uh, the allowed region, are such that uh, where the actual mass of Higgs is to be, that part is? Uh, It's not, not a question of coincidence. The point is that LEP was not able to probe beyond 114 GeV. Okay. because it could not have produced a higgs beyond 100 with mass bigger than 114 gv with enough rates so 114 gv was kind of the limiting value of lep all right now the limit from the tevatron which it, it, uh, delineated only the region from 160 gv onwards that had to do with the fact that the tevatron kind of p bar p experiment was not able to Uh, was able to see the higgs clearly only in the range 160 to 180 where it will have decays into the uh, virtual w pairs which will produce some leptons or bb bars in the intermediate region between 125 to 160 the really powerful uh, final state was two photons and for the tevatron energies the higgs production rates were not large enough at the, for the inclusively produced higgs decaying into two photons to give a signal so tevatron was not able to probe in this intermediate mass range have i answered your question siddharth yeah thank th okay so that is actually the view. therefore when lhc was designed people had designed it such that no matter what the mass of the top quark is because the production rates depend on the top quark i explained that to you people independent of the top quark mass can you see the higgs boson in the type di photon channel 
because in the mass range 120 to 160 or 155 the really clean mode was indeed only the uh, diphoton channel and to some accuracy the dihigs where it, uh, the higgs digging into a pair of a virtual and a real z producing four lepton channel but the rates again for the four lepton channel were very small and even the diphoton since the branching ratio in the diphotons is something like one part in 10 to the 4 this was really required large production rates and that's what required the lhc energy okay all right okay. yeah. yeah thank you again uh, so now we end session one and the next session starts from 11. Yeah. <laughs> because should we take 10 minutes break or just we should start it right away from 11 because it's already 11. Maybe we take a five minute water yeah, break. Take, Maybe uh, five minutes. Five minute, break. five minute water break, please. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So thanks again for uh, your patience. Thank you. I think this is the old uh, timetable, I guess, because I don't see the title of the talk here. Do you have a new one? Yes, let me share. Ah, you share it, yeah. Maybe you can also
hello, is Professor Peter Astra here? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. uh, could you please uh, try to share your screen in the meantime? Right. I will, I will stop sharing and then you can start okay. sharing. Okay, so I hope. Uh, yes, it's visible. Yeah. In December, uh, because of now. Should we start? Uh, let's start at level five. Okay. So probably you can start, right? It's 11 or 5. I think we can start. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of this morning. Uh, my name is Prabhat, and I will be coordinating this session. Uh, we will have four talks in this session. So first two talks will be 25 minutes uh, with five minutes for questions. And last two talks will be 15 plus 5. Uh, I will remind the speakers five minutes before their time ends. So please kindly adhere to the time. Please keep your questions till the end of the talk. Uh, if you have any question in the middle of the talk, uh, please drop them in the chat box and we will take them in the end. So without any further delay, let's welcome our first speaker, Professor Tito Shankarai from IIT Kharagpur. He will talk about bottom-up composite Higgs phenomenology. So Professor Rai, over to you. Uh, so I, I hope I am audible uh, uh, and yes. my slides are visible, right? Yes, perfect. Okay. okay. 
Okay, okay. Okay, so let me first of all, uh, you know, thank the organizers for inviting me and for hosting uh, such a nice event to commemorate the 10 years of the Higgs discovery. So uh, the mandate that I got from the organizers is to speak uh, about composite Higgs models. Uh, of course, you know, I won't be able to do a complete job with it, not only restricted by time, but also limited by my experience in this field. So uh, essentially, you know, but the discovery of the Higgs, uh, you know, 10 years back uh, heralded what we can call the Higgs era, where in this uh, you know, scheme of things in high energy physics, there will always be a, a considerable attention uh, to study the Higgs and its properties. And this is because the discovery of the Higgs was not a discovery of another you know, vanilla, um, you know, uh, particle uh, in the zoo of standard model particles, but probably it was our first glimpse into that notorious uh, class of particles, which are known as uh, scalar particles. And this kind of non-trivially updated the standard model particles zoo. So one way to think about this is that before the discovery of the Higgs, uh, the standard model particles uh, consisted of uh, vector bosons, but these were not any uh, random vector bosons. These, they were all gauge bosons. And then there were the matter fields, which all happens to be uh, some kind of chiral uh, fermions. So these particles uh, have a kind of an personal symmetry, which is of course inexact and spontaneously broken by electric symmetry breaking, uh, but they are enough uh, remnant symmetry uh, for, for them to be protected from, you know, uh, uh, potentially dangerous uh, uh, stabilization issues from the UV. Now, the Higgs is a completely different beast because it does not have any intrinsic symmetry that can insulate it from these, um, you know, by UV destabilizations. And this was, of course, identified long before the Higgs was discovered in 2012. Um, and it goes by the um, gauge hierarchy problem uh, paradigm. And there is, I would say, an industry or maybe even a civilization of uh, uh, models uh, which, have, uh, which have various ways of addressing uh, these gauge hierarchy problems. So this cartoon um, over here shows some of these approaches. Now, if you look at the gauge hierarchy problem very nicely, it, it, it basically arises because you are, you are conjecturing the existence of a, um, you know, a fundamental scalar in your theory. So I would say one very simple way to deal with this is to imagine that the Higgs that we have discovered is not a fundamental scalar at all. Uh, you can conjecture that the Higgs is a composite object which is ultimately built of some, uh, you know, subparticles uh, which may have their own symmetries and therefore in the UV, uh, in, in place of the Higgs, you will get all these uh, constituents of the Higgs and they may be protected from uh, UV sensitivities uh, due to their symmetries like that happens uh, to chiral fermions or gauge bosons. Okay. So, so, you know, and, and again, this conjecture that the Higgs is a composite scalar is not a revolutionary one. After all, in the 20th century itself, we discovered a plethora of scalar particles, which was later identified to be bound states of quarks and antiquarks and, uh, and were christianed as uh, uh, mesons. So you can think of uh, these uh, Higgs as some kind of uh, a, a bound state of more fundamental particles. Now, from the bottom up, the important difference between point like fundamental particles and let's say a composite Higgs would be that the composite Higgs will have some extension in space. It will have a shape in space. And therefore you can ascribe an intrin intrinsic length scale of the Higgs. Like it's, it's like the size of the Higgs in space.
And uh, as soon as you have a length scale associated with that length scale, you of course have a um, you know um, uh, mass scale, uh, and let's call this mass scale as f of h, which is of course inversely related to the uh, length scale of the Higgs or the size of the Higgs, and this. Uh, energy scale is what is known as the compositeness scale. So one way of thinking of this is the following, that below the compositeness scale, the constituents of the Higgs uh, are able to confine and um, remain together, and you see the Higgs as the effective degree of freedom. But as you move uh, the scale beyond the compositeness scale, the Higgs essentially kind of dissolves into its uh, you know, uh, constituents, and and therefore, uh, if you if if you imagine that none of these constituents are scalars anymore, uh, this uh, you know problem with scalars and gauge hierarchy problem uh, just disappears simply because at that scale there is no longer any fundamental scalar in your theory. So this is a very naive and straightforward way to address uh, the gauge hierarchy problem by doing away with any scalars in the UV. And what is also interesting and uh, I would say, um, you know, minimal in this framework is that within the composite Higgs, there is an intrinsic, you know, uh, mass scale. That is the scale, this compositeness scale. So this is an intrinsic dimensionful parameter in the theory. And you would expect that everything in this theory would be proportional to this uh, compositeness scale. Um, for example, you would expect the weak scale, the Higgs mass, to be at the compositeness scale, because that's the only dimension full scale uh, sitting around. You would also expect that the masses of all the prions, which is the like the subconstituents of the Higgs, of this you know, assumed composite Higgs, would also be at that same mass. So you are you are basically having a very flat uh, spectrum where you have the Higgs, the weak scale all the standard model masses, uh, uh, standard model particle masses, and the masses of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, prions all at the same scale. And this is very predictive and therefore has already been ruled out uh, from the lab data. We know that if you have a large number of these exotic resonances at the scale of the Higgs mass, and they necessarily should have uh, standard model, um, uh, you know, gate charges. After all, you know, they will combine together from to form the Higgs, and the Higgs has non-trivial standard model gate charges. So its prions will also have non-trivial uh, standard model uh, charges, and they would typically couple to the standard model gauge bosons and radiatively correct the two-point functions of the Z boson and the W boson and mess up with the electroweak precision data. Now, we have a lot of data collected at the Z pole in LEP. And from that itself, we find that this very, very overtly simple picture of composite Higgs, uh, where the masses of these constituent uh, prions, the Higgs mass, the weak scale are all at the compositeness scale does not work. They are simply ruled out uh, by, um, you know, uh, by the electric precision data. And this is what you can see in this plot uh, where a chi-square fitting to the precision electric data is done. And you see the best fit values kind of pushes this ratio of the weak scale to the compositeness scale far below one. So the best fit value is around 0.2 uh, or even smaller. So you need a kind of a parametric hierarchy between the weak scale and the scale of compositeness or the scale of where these new exotic resonances should, should show up. And this can be done, uh, one way this can be done is to assume that the Higgs is not only composite, but it is also a pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson. A pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson would mean that the Higgs can be naturally parametrically lighter than the rest of the resonances in that sector. So this is how you can create this small hierarchy and survive uh, the data from um, LEP. So, uh, so just to, you know, absolutely from bottom up, if you want to have a composite Higgs, uh, you end up with this rather elaborate uh, setup, you know, where, of course, on one hand, you have all the standard model particles except the so-called composite Higgs, but then you have to conjecture this additional strongly interacting sector where 
you know, there's some kind of strong dynamics, probably a strong gauge dynamics is going on that confines this prions to form the uh, Higgs uh, scalar, the composite Higgs scalar, but it should also produce more scalars and a potential that can spontaneously break some kind of a global symmetry of this strong sector G to a subgroup H. And you want to identify our standard model Higgs as one of the Goldstone modes sitting in this coset space of G by H. But this, of course, is, you know, you get a uh, um, you know, composite Higgs, which is Goldstone, which means that it is massless. And of course, the in, in information that we just discussed uh, in the previous talk and what we learned on 4th of July 2012 is that, of course, the Higgs has a non-trivial large mass at around 125 G. So you have to somehow arrange for it, and that can be done if you promote the Higgs to becoming a pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson, which means that you need some mechanism to explicitly break this global symmetry of the strong sector. One very elegant way of doing this is to imagine a some kind of a linear mixing between the strong sector and the rest of the standard model states. After all, the Higgs at some stage have to talk to the standard model particles and drive electroweak symmetry breaking. So this connection is inevitable and you can do it by having a kind of a linear mixing and this is what is known as partial compositeness. So for this linear mixing to go through, you now need the strong confining dynamics to not only create the composite Higgs, but also it has to confine and create uh, you know, composite operators. Uh, you know, if you uh, like an analogy, uh, it would not only need to create the mesons, but it would probably need to create, uh, you know, things like baryons and, uh, you know, vector mesons and things like that. So you need this confining dynamics to also create these kind of vector operators that can linearly mix with the standard model um, uh, fermions. And these, uh, you know, strong operators are like saturated by some uh, composite, um, you know, um, resonances of the strong fermionic composite resonances of the strong sector, which are collectively known as top partners. Again, it is given that if you have a fermionic operator, you can just combine them, let's say with a gamma mu or whatever you want, and create a uh, uh, you know a vector-like operator of the strong sector. And these vector-like operators will be saturated with uh, vector bosons, composite vector bosons, which can linearly mix with the you know, elementary vectors bosons of the standard model. And these are sometimes collectively called uh, the gluon partners. So in some sense, the simplest, you know, if you pare it down, uh, the bare uh, structure of any composite Higgs framework would require require multiple uh, length scales, okay? So you, at one end, you will have this uh, pseudo number Goldstone Higgs, whose mass is radiatively generated due to this explicit breaking and linear mixing uh, at, of course, 125 GV, which is at, let's say, the weak scale. Now, this has to be parametrically lighter than the composite resonances, which is the top partners and the gluon partners, um, just to survive the uh, electroweak precision data. But interestingly, if you take such a scenario and do the computation for the Higgs mass, its dependence on this resonance masses and the, um, you know, and the uh, compositeness scale is like the one shown on this slide that the MH square goes like uh, MT square, which is the top mass square times these resonance mass square divided by the compositeness scale square. Now, since we know now that the Higgs mass is lighter than the top, you need also now another hierarchy between the compositeness scale and the masses of this composite partner, which is why you have this third uh, scales included, uh, which is basically the cutoff scale of the theory or the compositeness scale of the theory and the uh, composite partners. They also have to be separated, but this hierarchy is not very problematic. After all, these are all kind of gauge bosons and a chiral fermion. And therefore, you can uh, sustain this hierarchy from any kind of UV destabilizations. So this is the you know, bare picture that you have. And the idea, you know, if you want to now try to uh, uh, you know, search and identify whether the discovered Higgs is a elementary object or a composite object, these are the targets that you have. You have to either look for uh, these uh, composite partners, the top partners or the gluon partners in a collider experiment, 
or you have to look into the higgs data and check whether you find signs of a pseudo nambu goldstone boson and a pseudo nambu goldstone composite higgs boson in those data so these are the two handles that you have uh so so if 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 i just like try to enumerate them uh these are the three approaches that you can take to probe a pngb composite higgs model okay so you can either think about searching for top partners at colliders these some of these top partners would evidently be uh, you know colored uh, they will have you know color charges and therefore profusely produced at hadron colliders like lhc they might have exotic standard model charges therefore you know producing stunning and visible signatures so that is one approach the other approach is to look into the higgs data and in this case there are two things that you can uh, you know search for number one is that since the higgs is a, a pseudo nambu goldstone goes boson it is non linearly realized and this non linear realization of the higgs means that you know uh, even at the weak scale uh, the higgs couplings will show a pattern of deviation from the standard model predictions that you can then uh, you know uh, search for the other uh, a more intrinsic feature of compositeness of the higgs is the fact that the higgs has this finite uh, size and which would mean that it's not any other uh, fundamental scalars of the standard uh, sorry fundamental constituent of the standard model will uh, be a structure function which would mean that these couplings will have very aggressive dependence on the momentum more than you know the usual uh, higgs standard model couplings where the um, you know these uh by couplings have only soft dependence uh, on momentum scale you know logarithmic dependence coming from renormalization group running but if the higgs has a finite extent it would have a more aggressive uh, you know uh, scaling with momentum and one can search for that so in the next uh, i don't know 5 minutes or so uh, let um, you know i ask for your indulgence where i try to share some of the work in these three directions that we are uh, you know we have carried out in our group uh, mainly led by shayan dash gupto and obik but these are just like sample uh, you know efforts in a more broad category of uh, studies vast uh, studies which have been done in these three directions to figure out whether the higgs is composite or not so the first and i i would say the most uh, simplest low lying fruit is to search for these composite resonances Uh, these composite resonances may be uh, you know as i said they may, may have color charges and therefore they can be produced even at lhc uh, and and all future colliders and you can then uh, check whether these resonances show up uh, a small uh, comment here is that these resonances remember are a product of a strongly interacting dynamics that creates the composite higgs so there is a very large non perturbative coupling that is floating around so it is it is very easily possible uh, that the that these resonances may have very large uh, decay width and uh, the decay width may be so high that the naive you know uh, narrow width approximation may start failing and may not capture uh, its true phenomenology at colliders so for example what i show here is some uh, you know limits on a top partner uh where along x axis i have the top partner mass and along y axis i have the decay width to mass ratio the solid lines are the lines uh, sorry the dashed lines are the lines that you get by assuming that these limits come from a narrow width approximation of these top partner resonances whereas for this solid line uh we have assumed that the propagators uh, of the uh you know of these resonances are the the full 1 pi sum propagator without actually taking the you know uh, the uh, approximation of replacing the loop by its decay width so if you take the full momentum dependence of these 1 pi sum propagators you get this uh, solid lines and as you can see as soon as this um, gamma by m hits a 20% or so level the solid lines and the dashed lines deviates a lot and this is something that one has to carefully uh, model uh, in case of you know this collider searches for um, uh, you know this composite strong resonances so these are some you know 
again, some uh, sample limits on these top partner masses. The takeaway information is just the following, that there's a plethora of these top partners, which you can, uh, you know, uh, which can come up uh, depending on the particulars of the strongly interacting sector, like what is the global symmetry G, what is the, you know, the sub, uh, subgroup H and so on and so forth. So depending on these details, you can have a variety of these exotic top partner resonances. And they usually would also come with uh, colored vector resonances, or both of which can be profusely produced at the um, uh, LHC. And since we have not seen any sign of them, they lead to aggressive uh, constraints. Excuse me, um, you know, five minutes. Uh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, for example, the present limit on this top partner masses range around 1.5 TV, whereas, you know, the typical uh, limit on the, the vector partner, you know, the gluon partner masses is around 2 TV or more. So, so you can clearly say that we are bleeding, uh, you know, fine tuning even in these composite Higgs models, like for probably every BSM scenario. However, uh, one, should, one should also note that if you really discover these uh, you know exotic uh, top partners and gluon partners you know it would of course be a discovery of new physics but you cannot still answer the question uh, about the compositeness of the higgs directly this will only be an indirect evidence of something that may be related to composite higgs but this inverse problem is complicated by the fact that there are other plethora of motivated VSM scenarios like extra dimensions, uh, you know, extra uh, uh, tidal generations and so on and so forth, which can have all these resonances and then it's not easy to differentiate between them. So probably a better way to think about this is to look at, into the Higgs data and study whether there is this kind of a deviation of the Higgs couplings uh, from the standard model prediction. So one of these deviations, which will always be present at every scale and therefore also at the weak scale, uh, you know, but comes from the fact that in these models, the Higgs is non-linearly realized. So you would see that the coupling of the Higgs to all the standard model states, the uh, standard model fermions and the gauge bosons would show a pattern of deviation where the deviation is a function of this ratio of the weak scale and the compositeness scale. So one can uh, search for this telltale uh, you know, deviation uh, from the standard model states and can identify whether the Higgs is non-linearly realized or not. At present, of course, we do not see a large deviation as was pointed out in the last talk and you can only put limits and I do not want to labor this point that the limits is again uh, pushing this hierarchy between the weak scale and the compositeness scale even farther, which would mean uh, that you still have more um, you know fine tuning but if you but if you go and and the lhc is probably expected to um, study uh, these higgs couplings at the weak scale at around 10% maybe for some channels uh, and uh, worse for others uh, and this may not by itself be enough to you know identify such a pattern of deviation and therefore identify a composite higgs and but we will do much better in future higgs factory but again, a caveat that if we discover such a pattern of deviation, we would still be talking about uh, the fact that the Higgs is non-linearly realized, and that's all. Of course, there is you know, examples of BSM model where the Higgs is fundamental, but still non-linearly realized, like the twin Higgs and so on and so forth. So, so this will be a discovery of the non-linearity, but still we cannot probably conclude that the Higgs itself is composite and has an extension in space. So, you know, before, without beating around the bush, in some sense, the real uh, telltale signature that the Higgs has an extension in space is to, is to identify uh, the structure functions uh, uh, of such a composite Higgs with other elementary states. As we know that if the uh, Higgs has a finite extension, the coupling with fundamental particles we know, will no longer be, you know, um, coupling constants having logarithmic dependence due to, uh, you know, the renormalization group running. It will have a more aggressive dependence on the momentum transfer uh, because they will be uh, structure functions. 
So this is kind of uh, nicely shown in this cartoon at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so what we have is that along x-axis, let's say you have the scale uh, the um, you know the uh, of uh, a a Higgs mediated process, and on and on y-axis you have the Higgs coupling extracted from that Higgs mediated process. So if you have a standard model Higgs, it will give you some value and uh, it will have a very slow logarithmic scaling with this uh, scale. So let's say in the range of interest in present and future collider, this, this would appear entirely flat. If, it, if now you have a non-linearly realized um, you know, uh, Higgs sector, uh, there will be a finite shift in these couplings, but that finite shift will still scale, uh, you know, um, um, very, very softly uh, with the uh, momentum. Whereas if you now have a composite Higgs, which has a non-trivial extent in space, uh, these couplings will have a very aggressive power law dependence on scale. And you would expect to, you know, just drop off quite before the you know, compositeness scale. After all, at the compositeness scale, the Higgs itself dissolves and these couplings do not cease to exist. So it will very quickly kind of fall off to a small values around the compositeness scale or below before it. So the real way of trying to uh, figure out whether the Higgs is composite or not is to find out whether it coupling shows such an aggressive uh, dependence on the scale. Now, the problem here is that what is this dependence on the momentum of these couplings? Because after all, uh, this is strong um, non-perturbative dynamics of the sector which produces the, uh, you know, uh, the composite Higgs, and it is not easy to model them um, uh, you know, uh, with perturbative quantum field theory. We know that you know, if you now, let's say, focus on the Higgs, uh, vector boson couplings, the HVV couplings, they are these very uh, nicely behaved numbers, gauge couplings, if we talk about elementary Higgs. In the case of this finite width composite Higgs, they would become some aggressive, uh, you know, momentum dependent object. But now the question is how to model them. There are many approaches to this. One can take a phenomenological approach. One can use holographic dualities with uh, gauge Higgs unified scenarios in higher dimensions. Uh, one can use lattice theory. Uh, in a recent uh, exercise, we tried to model these structure functions uh, using, let's say, the uh, leading results from a large N approximation. So we are assuming that this confining dynamics is some SUN gauge group, which produces this uh, uh, you know, composite Higgs, and this N is large, and you take the leading um, you know, effect from there. And then you, know, you model what this structure function would look like, at least the leading a dependence on the momentum would look like, and then you can go ahead and try to do some kind of phenomenology. For example, we looked at uh, the associated production of such a Higgs with a Z, where the Z decays to a pair of lepton and the Higgs decays to a pair of uh, bottom quarks. And you assume that this Higgs Z Z coupling is not a number, but now this you know uh, complicated momentum dependent structure function. And what we end up getting is something what is shown in this plot on the right along x axis, I have the center of mass energy and along y axis, I have the cross section. So the red line shows the typical secular decline of these uh, cross section for elementary Higgs due to the uh, one by S suppression. Whereas if you use the structure functions, you end up getting these blue uh, and uh, pink lines, which shows the very drastic deviations and the peaks typically app. Uh, happens at the when you cross the mass scales of these underlying resonances. So every time you pass those resonances, you get a kind of a peak. So the way to uh, you know search for them in a real collider experiment is to it, it, one way to do it. Let's say is to do the following: is to look at the tails of kinematic distributions of various Higgs-driven processes. So you take a Higgs driven process and you look at the kinematic tail where the Higgs is pushed uh, uh, you know, off shell. So as soon as the Higgs is pushed off shell, uh, if, it is a, you know, if it is a composite Higgs, its couplings will change drastically as opposed to an elementary Higgs where it will hardly change at all. And these drastic changes in the tail will show, us, uh, show up as a great you know, deviation in these kinematic distributions. So these are the plots that we kind of, you know, example kinematic distributions generated using that associated production of Higgs, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, channel where the Higgs decays to a pair of bo uh, bottom quark and the uh, Z decays to a, a pair of lepton. And we have created all kind of, you know, um, uh, kinematic uh, quantities using this um, end state entities. And the red line are the lines that you would get for an elementary Higgs. And let's say the blue line lines that you can see in these plots are the ones that you would get from a composite Higgs. Now, instead of going into the details of what these kinematic observables are, uh, what we can clearly see that if you look into the tail, every time uh, these kinematic distribution for the composite Higgs expectedly starts deviating from the standard model prediction. So, so one way to really answer the question whether the Higgs is composite or not is basically to study the Higgs in its you know, off-shell condition and look at processes uh, where the Higgs is off-shell and probably look into the tail of various kinematic distributions. Okay. So you know, uh, now this program, if you want to really study the Higgs in, in its off-shell condition, uh, you would now need a lot of legroom a lot of energy available to you so that you can push the Higgs off shell. And therefore in this direction, uh, probably you would, uh, you would, you know, hope, of course you can do certain things with the LHC itself, the high luminosity LHC, but you know, um, uh, the proper direction for trying to um, study for this is to basically uh, have more energy at your disposal that you can really push the Higgs off shell and then study uh, the various properties of that off-shell Higgs and specifically look at the kinematic tails. And that would kind of tell you whether the Higgs couplings are have some aggressive momentum dependence beyond the usual logarithmic scaling. And, and in, in, in some sense, that would be a telltale signature of the yeah, actually. Of the top. So, thank you for... Uh, your patience and uh, I think uh, I I've already exhausted my time so let me kind of uh, wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, thank you Professor for the wonderful talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions please go ahead. We are already running short on time. So I can see two hands raised, uh, three hands raised sorry. So uh, Professor Sudhir, if you could. Yeah. Uh, what is the limit you can have for F on F? Uh, limit you can have on F? F means uh, the composite scale. scale? Composite scale, yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me try to again share my screen. I don't know what happened. Uh, so, am I, uh, can you uh, see my. Uh, no, not it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so of course you can push this scale F up as you wish. Uh, right, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but then you would pay with fine tune. That is basically the issue. Uh, so, uh, but the fine tuning is like, a, is like the ratio of uh, the scale F and the um, weak scale. So in principle, you can just uh, keep pushing the um, F up and you have to pay in terms of fine tuning. If your question is related to what is the present, you know, limit on F, uh, right. it, uh, yeah. okay. so it is around, uh, if, if you take just the precision data, the limit on F is uh, lower. It is around um, 700 or 800 GeV. Uh, now, now, depending on the details of the UV completion of your model, you will have different resonances. So these resonances can then, um, you know, um, make your theory more fine-tuned and push this scale F beyond 1.5 or 2 TV. Okay, so it is still a uh, natural solution to Haraki problem? Well, Some models I, I, well I, I, okay, so I would say this has the same level of fine-tuning as, let's say, uh, the most, uh, you know, uh, natural version of supersymmetry. So it has a lot of fine tuning uh, already because we do not see these resonances, um, and 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 that is like at the same order as standard model. I wouldn't, you know, it's not better than the standard, uh, but not better than supersymmetry. Sorry, supersymmetry, not better than the MSSM. It's at the same okay. level. All right. Okay. Thank you.
Siddharth, can you please go ahead and ask? Can I ask my question? Uh, Siddharth, can you please go ahead and ask? If not, then Professor Shubhaditya. Yes, yeah, Siddharth can type the question in the chat box. You can take it. Hi, Tito. This was a wonderful talk. I, I just have a, a question regarding the kinematic distributions that you showed, which distinguishes the composite Higgs to the fundamental ones. And I, I, I was wondering that what is what are the class of kinematic variables where this uh, distinction in the tail actually can show up? Because I see a bunch of uh, invariant mass distributions, and also I see the transverse momentum of the leptons and bottom cores and so on. So can you comment on that? Yes. So, so I would say that, you know, practically we tried with all these, you know, uh, things that you can construct out of those four things in the final state here. There's also another mm -hmm. study that was done by uh, Tao Han, another by uh, Gustav Boardman in a similar fashion. And it seems that probably, you know, any kind of, if, if you take the Higgs sufficiently off shell, Mm -hmm. And then you look at any Higgs mediated process, uh, okay. nearly all of these kinematic distributions, you know, would start showing deviations in the tail, right? Because so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so the answer is that, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, everything that we try to construct in our, uh, you know, example, short deviation when you get the Higgs off shell. And probably this should be, you know, generic. But okay, I cannot. Yeah, so it, 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 it is immaterial whether you look into the decay products of the Z or of the Higgs or a combination of them that actually shows up in the uh, at least in the tail of the distribution. Yes, that is because you see this, you know, if you see hmm. the process in this slide this non you know, non-trivial momentum dependence in the cross section okay. Okay. shows up be before the, you know, either before the Z the or the Higgs. Harder decay right. products are considered. Yes. Right, right. So you yeah. already have this, you know, new, uh, you know, uh, modulation with momentum inbuilt in this, uh, uh, you know, cross section mm -hmm. or the differential cross section. Okay. Now, whatever you do uh, would show deviation from the standard model uh, uh, behavior as long as you are sufficiently off shell. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you, Pito. Yep. Thanks. Professor Ghosh, could you please unmute and ask? Uh, nice talk. So, just a quick question. So, in one of the slides, you actually showed a relation between the Higgs mass, uh, the number of color, the top, uh, the mass of this new quartz. And the scale. That's right. So let me yeah. go try to go there. Yeah. Yeah. This, this yes. So just uh, so roughly, I mean, if I consider the standard model, the mass of the Higgs is about seventy percent of that of the top, roughly. So from that viewpoint, like, is there any wildest possibility like this MQ and the SH of the similar order, like both in the ballpark uh, ballpark of a TV and not like ten times larger? Ah, uh, well, so this is, so you see MQ square by FH square is like MH square by MT square, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this is, this is basically what it is, right? So uh, you can, of course, tune the MQ to be slightly lighter. So, okay, let's say this, there is the weak skill, there is a compositeness skill. Yeah. And we know that the exotic, uh, you know, uh, uh, top partners and uh, vector partners has to lie somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. It has to be an order of magnitude heavier than the Higgs because of this PNGB suppression. Sure, sure, sure. But where it is, whether it is closer to the cutoff or you can push it down, is kind of a uh, choice and, and depends on the details of the UV completion of the strong sector that you want. Okay. So what I'm showing here where the composite uh, partners is at 1 TV is just to make it more, let's say, uh, you know, uh, interesting in terms of collider. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. It. In terms of the BSM searches. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's okay. okay. So, and this yeah. NC but is. As you said, you can tune it to be closer to the cutoff. Okay. If you want. Okay. And this NC is the effective number of color, everything below that scale. 
yes, so NC is just so these are generated by the uh, Coleman Weinberg potential. Mm -hmm. uh, so NC is just the color charge of these, uh, you know, exotic resonances which are there in these loops. Okay. 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 So you can you can consider them them to be three. Let's say for for, for a okay. You know, okay. kind of okay. number. Okay. okay. Thank you, teacher. Uh, Professor Shivani, could you please unmute us? Uh, hello, Tirtha, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so this is regarding the plot. Can you please go to the plot? Uh, sorry, which plot? Uh, the, the last uh, the last uh, slide, I oh, think, okay. you had, yeah, okay. those distributions, actually. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so actually, I think uh, this is not a new question, but I just wanted to understand that usually the study that you have, they are used to place bounds, right, on uh, the uh, parameters, uh, whatever you have. I was just wondering that uh, th these plots, uh, in the context of experiments, suppose that, I mean, instead of talking about placing bounds, if in nature uh, these couplings indeed exist, okay, does experimentally it means that uh, I will find in my experiments, which is say bounded by some uh, energy, uh, center of mass energy, I would find actually more events with high PT and high invariant mass. This is one question and connected question is that, is it perfectly fine with the unitarity in that case? Okay, okay. Well, uh, okay. thank you for this question. So first of all, let me tell you that this, these plots that I'm showing are not mouths, right? These are just like signal predictions, okay? So, so you're absolutely correct. This is what, if, uh, what this kind of a framework is predicting. It is predicting that if you go at Ahead and able to access this, uh, you know, tails of this kinematic distribution at LHC or maybe at some future collider, and you see that in the tail there is a kind of uh, a deviation. You see more uh, events with high PT and and so on and so forth than expected from the standard model. It would be a kind of a signature of, uh, the, you know, uh, of these, um, uh, you know, composite uh, Higgs scenarios. Okay. Uh, now coming back to your question about unitarity, uh, so this is uh, this is uh, you know so there is many way let's say to model the uh, uh, you know these structure function like coupling between let's say a composite Higgs and elementary in this case Z goes on. Okay, mm -hmm. one popular way to deal with this is to write down a kind of a chiral Lagrangian for the uh, composite Higgs and then extend it. Uh, expand it and write down an effective field theory. A very popular approach to this is what is known as the strongly interacting linear Higgs. And this, you know, if you see in this plot, this uh, black uh, dotted line is this, you know, prediction from the Silch framework. Uh, now, in this case, as you said, that it will start violating unit because the, you know, the EFT will at, at some time fail. And then you have all these issues with unit added. The one of the reasons why you know uh, actually modeling uh, these structure functions uh, carefully using let's say large n or or lattice results is you end up getting scenarios which are unitary. Okay, so while it might look in this plot that the blue line is blowing up at high scales, but if I had extended this to even higher energies, you would see that the blue line at some stage would go below the red line, and in the end, unitarity will be uh, restored. So the way we have tried to, you know, um, um, you know, uh, model these structure function like couplings is to keep. Uh, unitarity in mind, and these theories are unitarity in the high scale, and that is also true for this kinematic distribution. So I'm again uh, zooming into the range where, of course, these deviations are highlighted, but at some stage this will fall off, and you, and of course, uh, if this theory is correct, then there is of this compositeness scale where the Higgs will just no longer exist, and at that scale, uh, these coupling, uh, these you know, plots will go to zero. And again, unitarity will be restored. I hope uh, that kind of answers your questions. So. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Uh, Professor Godbole, could you please unmute and ask? Thanks. Actually, most of the discussion uh, that happened now has uh, more or less uh, covered the extent of the comment that I wanted to make. But uh, going back to Shubhaditya's question, I wanted to say that generically, when one has momentum dependent couplings, it is the PT distributions that are the most robust uh, 
in the under the predictions the invariant masses uh, both from the point of view of experimental reconstruction and also because of the cancellation among the momentum behavior of the different individual particles when you calculate the invariant mass distribution the most robust one are pt i mean as you can see that delta r of course uh, is uh, more or less talking about the uh, 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 about the how do you call getting everything either you know the relative orientation and therefore that is uh, reasonably uh, distinguished and so is the pt but uh, invariant masses usually tend to get smeared uh, quite often from other effects and so this was just the i wanted to answer the question that shubhaditya had raised and then i was going to make a comment about unitarity but then the discussions already uh, took care of that okay so thank you very much for giving me the occasion to talk thanks i know thank you this uh, yeah so yeah that is the thank you so i was thank yeah. you okay. thank you again professor for this wonderful talk and answering all these questions uh, so we are running short on time so let's uh, move ahead uh, okay. and thank you for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation so let me just stop sharing now is it fine yes yes please okay. uh, now i don't know how to stop sharing okay thank you Yeah. So next speaker is Professor Joyadi Chakravarti from IIT Kanpur, and he will talk about EFT to sniff out heavy scalars. Uh, Professor Chakravarti, if you could please unmute and share your screen. Yeah. We audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. So I have shared my screen. Yes. So actually, I'm uh, traveling, so I prefer to switch off my video. I mean, it's my uh, allowed. Actually, yeah, I can share my user bandwidth. Hi, you Hello. can turn off. You can turn off your video if you want. Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, because the bandwidth is not good. Yeah. Please let me know when I can start. You can start. So yeah, so before I start, uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for organizing this wonderful um, uh, you know, um, uh, this symposium, one day symposium after this, to celebrate the Higgs discovery uh, uh, decade. So uh, today I'll uh, talk about, uh, not exactly about the Higgs, um, but um, uh, how, but to something related to Higgs. Uh, so as you know, that Higgs is a, a, a stellar object, so now after the discovery of Higgs, uh, we have been a little bit greedy and then uh, we post the question that if uh, in the nature there's only one Higgs or there uh, could be multiple other heavy scalars and if uh, that is so and as you have seen there are lots of phenomenological models uh, uh, and most of them actually contain uh, non-standard model heavy scalars. But the question actually if we have those kind of scenarios and then what would be a good uh, or nice framework and uh, to you know uh, realize uh, their presence so uh, the thing that uh, i will talk about today i would like to use eft effective field theory as a kind of a sniffer dog uh, to smell the presence of heavy scalars if it is um, around the um, corner and not far away uh, from us so Yeah. So, so that so before I proceed, I would uh, like to uh, push the uh, bigger uh, question that we want to address. So, uh, the thing is basically we have uh, seen in the literature there are so many uh, uh, different kind of phenomenological models, right? And uh, because they have different kind of interactions, different kind of symmetries, different kind of particles, and so on. So, even when you have the data. Uh, it is uh, uh, really difficult uh, to uh, comment on which one is good, which one is bad, or make a kind of a comparative value and so on. So the bigger question that you want to understand, can you come up with a uh, framework using effective field theory such that we can bring 
most of those uh, scenarios on a platform uh, where we can really compare them. Compare them in the sense because they will be described by the same kind of symmetry, by the same kind of particle content or degrees of freedom, and uh, so on. So, for example, let's say look, in, look, look in this uh, cartoon. So, what you have different kind of BSM uh, theories, okay? And you can see that the small phi stands for the standard model particles, okay? And this capital phi are the basically heavy non standard model particles. And here I'm saying heavy in a sense that if I, they can be integrated out and EFT can be evaluated with this assumption. So, now there's a two way to look into this thing. So, one, we have this known theory, which is the standard model one. We know its symmetry, uh, including the internal symmetry and the space time symmetry and so on, and you know the particle content. So what we can do, if we are blind to the kind of easy theory, we can construct effective operators using that information about the particle content and the symmetry, and we can get a different mass dimension, you know, the finite number of uh, effective operators, which are non redundant basis. Now, for example, let's say uh, this is the island of some, for example, let's say dimension six operators. So this is the bigger island that you are creating using this information about the low energy theory. So now what we are looking at about this map, different theories, we are isolating those heavy modes and we are integrating them out. And once you integrate them out, basically you are writing this theory in terms of an effective theory. And because you are integrating out, you will generate some kind of effective operators, which will capture the footprint of those heavy modes in the interactions. So then eventually you will get a kind of a subset uh, of this within this island. So this island is the biggest one and in whatever be your theory, you cannot overflow uh, this island. That's the idea, right? So now you get a different theory and you get a different patch of these islands. And because there will be some kind of similarity in the intersense pattern, there will be some overlapping uh, zones. That means they two different theories after being integrated out, they may lead to some set of operators and some of the operators could be common or uh, thing. So in this way, we can create all those patches. So now, so if you have, if you can generate all these islands, so then we can look into these islands and then we can try to understand the correlation among these operators and the observers and from that we can uh, say something. And that's basically the idea. Now, while doing this analysis, there are two things are very important. One is basically how to integrate out those different kinds of scenarios and how to get those bigger islands. So that's the more complete theoretical constructions. And that's why uh, I've divided our prescription basically in two parts. One is the methodologies. So these are the basically small developments uh, to achieve those necessary methodologies or the equipment. And once you perform all these methodologies, you get all the operators and all those things, then in the light of the uh, data, you have to perform the analysis. And these are the uh, papers where we have uh, performed the detailed analysis using those EFT things and the competitive analysis and, uh, and the competitive analysis for different kind of scenarios. So for today's talk, I'll mainly focus on this my uh, construction methodologies. And what I'll do, as I'm going into much detail about those methodologies, I would show you the glimpse of those individual small baby steps that we have taken to reach out uh, and this full uh, thing. And if you and after the talk, if you're interested, actually, you can talk about it a bit more. So, yeah, so uh, the way I'll be uh, following up this talk first, I'll talk about the bottom up versus top down after the effective field theory, and then I'll show how different kind of BSMs can be realized in terms of effective field theories, and then I'll use the observers, basically the low energy observers, and which are nothing but I'll treat them as a set of operators and I'll use them like a response screen and how those set of operators uh, will help us to discriminate different kind of theories. And that's what lead to the classification of uh, BSMs. And then I'll move uh, to the fact that in the other way around, if we know the, if we're interested for some particular operator, then how do we know that what kind of BSM scenarios can offer you that kind of operator so instead of having a blind hunch? So how to do that reverse engineering? And related to standard model Higgs, if they couple with some kind of non standard model uh, heavy fan neuron and having some kind of evaluation, how to capture that effect? And then I'll uh, talk about the uh, future direction that if we are fortunate enough and find out new particles, then how this whole calculations, uh, which is based on kind of SNP, can be modified and need to be modified. So, yeah. 
So the bottom of Apple, uh, so what we have uh, as an information, you know the standard model as a low energy theory, you know the particle content and the symmetry. And based on that, what you are doing, you are actually constructing this effective operator starting from dimension five. And there are the series of interactions, and then this is the blobs which actually contain the effective operators. Now in this construction, you do not uh, need the exact need to know the exact nature of the EV theory. And that's why when you write down this uh, effective operators along with this you know, part of the Lagrangian, you add the Wilson coefficients as the three parameters. And actual origin of those Wilson coefficients are not known. And that's why you add one operator, you are basically adding one extra three parameter in your theory. And that's why it's like in the bottom of the approach, the invoking more and more uh, operators is basically you know, including more and more three parameters in your theory. But the other way, what we can do, you start with your uh, favorite uh, EV theory, and that EV theory you can recast in terms of uh, like a pure standard model like scattering, and then and then there will be pure new uh, physics process, and then pure standard model process. So now, if this new physics uh, propagators, this can be anything, and if this is a basically heavy particle, you can integrate that out, and you get this effective operator. Now, unlike the previous one, here actually you are, you are starting with the EV theory, so you know what kind of interesting it is. So, and also what kind of particles are there. So that's why here also you get the set of effective operators, but here the Wilson coefficients are actually the function of this BSM parameters. So that's why you may get end up with a multiple effective operators, but those effective operators, all of them will eventually function of those very limited number of BSM parameters. So in the theoretical uh, point of view, in this particular case, the Wilson coefficients are related to each other, unlike the previous one, or because in the bottom of that book, we do not know how to relate different kind of Wilson coefficients. And because we will be dealing with many theories, so it is uh, obvious that it will be difficult to do everything by hand. So that's why we prefer to uh, come up with an automatized tool, and that's why we develop this codec. And this codec is basically offers you one loop Wilson coefficients uh, once you identify what are the heavy modes and, the, and their interactions. So it gives you the Wilson coefficients, and you get the Wilson <laughs> coefficients that you, as well as the one loop level. And also, it helps you to run those operators down till the electric scale, and such that you can compare them with the you know and the you know, your energy data. So, so far, it can actually integrate heavy scalars, uh, and uh, it can delete the heavy like mixing for the scalars, and all the uh, integrations like equation of motion, different kind of identities, integration by parts, all are taken care of. Okay, heavy functions also can be integrated out, but only that multiple heavy integer functions. And we are adding some more features with it. Like for example, in the loop, if you have a fermion and the scalar, which is a mixed statistics kind of diagrams, and also the heavy light fermion mixing, and also to automatize the dimension eight computation up to three and one loop. And for the bottom of the approach, you need to you know, come up with a proposal where you can you know, construct those effective operators using the symmetry and the particle content. And for that, we have you know, developed this you know, group event polynomial construction, which you know, allow you to you know, work with any kind of degrees of freedom and get the effective operator from any mass dimension. So yeah, so now, uh, once you have this thing, so what you are doing, so once you have some low energy theory, Using this uh, grid, we can construct this bigger island. And because we have this codec in our hand, so you can have my uh, 20, 30, whatever number of uh, BSM theories, you just identify them and you just uh, integrate, identify the heavy modes, you integrate them out, you identify those small batches, and basically that's why you are uh, ready to compare them because we have brought all those theories on the same footing. Yeah. So now, uh, uh, as I was telling, that we have different kind of observers, but for example, uh, we'll choose the electric vision observers and weak signal state. Okay. So here, if you uh, look at the, these observers, actually can be recursed in terms of this effective operator. So the leading or AWPO, we have these effective operators. Okay. And if you go for the NLO corrections, and then you will have then these. And these many operators which are offering contributions to EWPO, and also the Higgs signal strength actually contains you know, part of the operators which is EWPO and NO1. 
and also on top of that you have these additional contributions so now once you have your favorite theory what you can see that what you integrate out the heavy moves and you see what are the subset of the effective operators that you are getting right and then you can look into this chart and immediately understand that okay what are the lower edge observers will be affected uh, by those effective set of operators Now, when you integrate out, you don't really I mean, get only these operators, but also you get some additional operators. Some of them are also BL violating, and there are some additional operators. So we are, we are we are clubbing them as additional operators, but one can certainly come up with some new observer, and these operators will belong to that set. So this we will use as our response screen. And to understand how uh, do, uh, how do different you know, BSM theories behave in presence of this screen. So I'll skip these dimensions operators because this is well known. Yeah. So now about the BSM classification, what uh, we have done actually, we have uh, started with a very simplistic scenario, and we have assumed that at a single point of time, the st your standard model is basically extended by one heavy scalar. Okay, and that heavy scalar, uh, are you know, missing the choice of the heavy scalars are basically you know motivated by different kind of uh, phenomenological models. So, for example, like it's a single scalar, it's a complex scalar, real triplet, complex triplet, doublet, whatever, and so on, which are basically the color singlets. And also, you have different kinds of lecture quotes in the literature, and which are basically the colored object. So, these uh, 15 uh, models are basically uh, we are interested in to uh, display what we are trying to convey the message. So now, uh, before uh, showing you the result, let me give you the um, idea of the heavy light and all those uh, things. So you can see when you are talking about the T-level generation, that means basically in the UV diagram, your heavy particle appears in the T-level propagator. When we call the heavy heavy loop, that means in the loop diagram, uh, you know, all the uh, propagators are basically heavy. But sometimes it may happen that in the loop diagram, you have a heavy and the light mixing. And that's what we call a heavy light mixing. Now, based on this nomenclature, what we have done, we have employed uh, codec and we have invoked individual models and we integrate out these individual heavy modes. Now you can see that once you integrate them out, these are the op non zero operators that you are getting. So this cross means that this operator is not being generated up to one loop. Okay. So this QAG operator will be generated at the, through the heavy light mixing, uh, but in case of real triplet, that operator is being generated at the T level itself. So in this way, we have completed and classified the generation or the emergence of those operator, whether it's a tree, whether heavy, heavy loop or heavy light loop. So in, yeah, and this is also like uh, other set of operators are being generated for all these models. So you can see on total 47 operators at max, we are being, uh, we are being able to generate up to this one loop uh, calculation. Right. So now we we'll see that uh, how uh, this will respond. So the idea is basically uh, we borrowed the idea um, of this thing from the optics. So let's say you have a race magic screen, and the magic screen actually can uh, club uh, the uh, rays of uh, different uh, of the same, same frequencies. So then what will happen is if you are passing uh, light of, uh, that contains different kind of frequencies through this magic screen, then on the right side after uh, being passed by. So uh, in the uh, you see the patches of you know uh, different uh, lights of uh, same frequencies. So that's we are uh, getting the idea here. So you start with these 15 models. We have integrated out those individual heavy uh, fields, and they are offering different set of effective operators. Okay, and then if we use this electrification observability model as my response scheme, and I pass them to this thing. So what I'll see that. The kind of operators that are affecting this observable, you know, that actually uh, is being, uh, you see these uh, uh, seven models to be the same footing. That means these models may contain different operators, okay, but it depends on what kind of screen you are using. For this screen, actually, these models are containing the exactly the same kind of operators. On, on the same basis, you will get a different class of operators which actually differ from this class by at least one operator. That means there will be only at least one operator which affect your this observable, which may belong to either class two or class one. It can be more than, than that also. And that's why looking into this observables on the set of operators, we can get this uh, four non-degenerate uh, set which contains all these 15 things. 
Now we'll use the same idea for others. In our skin, let's say we are using the Higgs signal strength at the our skin, and then we see we get six different in such club, and each of them uh, can contain desired models. Like class H1 cannot discriminate uh, this H2 delta and quadruple model based on the operators um, uh, are affecting uh, that HSS or the Higgs signal strength. And we are repeating this same task for different observers and trying to understand that how they are being you know classified or being clubbed under different set of observers. Now it is a, it will be interesting to see that if we place this screen one by one rather than using one at a time, and then this is what we are getting. So you start with this 15 you know, theories, and then you place first this model, and then you see that okay, these two models are. You know, this meter from there, and then you get this kind of operators, and then so on. And I put all the spins one by one. And if you can design some kind of observers in the name of additional operators and into the BLV, and then you see that you can actually see the distinct feature of different models, and that's why all of them contains at least one feature, one smoking gun feature, which is absent in the other. But again, you can you cannot like get all of them non make them non degenerate because you can get this kind of depth to clock scenarios which even you, you use all the observers you will get and then to be you know, respond to be in a desired manner that means if the theory is like content this or this or this based on these observers it will be difficult to discriminate them so now without you know, going too much analysis and all those things what i try in the result i put this plot to uh, show you uh, that uh, difference when you perform the analysis bottom up and the top down. So as I was saying, that in a bottom up approach, what you do actually input those operators and they are actually free parameters. So you basically increase the degrees of freedom from the fitting point of view. So that's why in a model independent approach, you get this whole allowed range of parameter consistent with the um, input uh, data. But when you use, let's say, um, uh, Use double model or on a quadruplet or the compressed field model. So all of them offering the exact nine operators. Okay, but here those nine operators are actually function of three parameters. So now and they are also related to each other. That's why when you come from a top down approach for a given theory, the allowed time pass is this. This is so minuscule compared to this larger thing. So the practice and uh, the most people follow that using this met analysis we allow. Uh, take the allowed, allowed range of this emission coefficients of the parameters and directly use that for the BSM that is somehow uh, slightly misleading. Professor, you have five minutes left. Okay, yeah. So now, uh, so uh, as I was saying, that if accidentally tells you that if you uh, have some interesting uh, anomaly and that anomaly can be identified by some kind of operators, then what you do, this is the generic approach that we have talked about, right? But on the other round, from the experimentalist colleague, if you come to know that, okay, this is the observer showing the anomalous behavior, then you try to identify what are the SMIP operators are actually can offer you that additional contributions. And then using our method, we can unfold that. And then using the symmetry argument, we can identify what kind of heavy fields can lead to this kind of operators. Because once you identify that, then automatically you can build your EV model. And then instead of having a blind hunch, hunch you can actually perform that realistically and data driven model building and this is some sort of one example that okay start from a clear effective operator and how to unfold and then identify what kind of heavy fields actually gives you this kind of operators okay so so now we talk about the city conserving sector and now it may happen that you have some kind of heavy finals so the vector like finals and that may couple to standard model Higgs, where you can have a series of violations. Okay, and then what will happen once you integrate these heavy modes, you get series violating operators. So you can see the CP odd operator is the counterpart of the CP conserving operators. So what we have shown uh, and computed that once you have this kind of interactions, how this can lead to partly CP violating operators or CP odd operators, CP conserving operators, and that's the first time you show that uh, you cannot. Just include CP or operators without adding the CP even operators because you cannot have any diagram where you are generating all the CP or operators because this eventually will be side by side always. 
So the analysis, though you are doing only for the CP or the observers, but you have to keep in mind to adding on the counter counter partner of the CP, even operators and the corresponding observers, and that's where you get much better you know, constraint on there. So yeah, so this is all uh, what I talk about is basically based on the standard model as a low energy theory. But if standard model is a um, uh, you know if we find out some new particle in uh, in the future, then of course the SNFT needs to be incorporated in a larger basis, and that's what our this uh, Greek can help you to get this bigger island along with the um, newly um, developed, newly identified particle. And these are the some example models um, of the particles that we have already incorporated at the uh, BSM EFT. Okay, so now uh, the, the take home message is uh, basically as I started with the primary aim to pin down the correct nature of the EFT theory. And as um, the plan is going on, so we need a complementary and uh, side by side um, impact from the bottom up and the top down approaches. And here we are using the observers as a set of effective operators to adjust those BSNs. So once you include more and more observers, you can pin down um, the um, correct nature of the BSN theory in a more refined way. And also, if you um, identify you know, um, uh, some um, uh, new particles or uh, new interactions, uh, and then from there you can understand using our this uh, diagrammatic guideline, then what kind of UV theory uh, can help you to uh, reach there. And also in the future, uh, if you get new particle, so we are providing also prescription to extend your SNFT and such that you can capture that effects as well. So, and I would like to end with uh, this our upcoming thing. So keep an eye for this upcoming thing. So we are trying to improve the theoretical vision and we have been able to integrate out the heavy scalars employing the modified equation of motion and getting the dimension eight operators. The reason basically there's um, proposals uh, that you can use and the general perception that if you use the classical equation of motion, we can remove the redundancy, but that is not certainly true and that eventually, you know, coincidentally actually uh, works up to dimension six, but if you go beyond dimension six, classical equation of motion doesn't give you the X and doesn't help you to get, remove all the redundancy. The George's prescription, which is the field definition is the nicest one. But, but what you have noted that if you have to do analysis for so many scenarios, uh, like we did, field definition doesn't have in that much algorithmic nature. So you have come up you know, with a new proposal, which is which we call in the modified equation of motion and which you know, generates the exact you know, result for the field definitions. And, uh, so I will just say that stay tuned uh, for this new year. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chakravarti, for the very wonderful talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please go ahead. So I can see one raised hand, uh, Professor Shubhaditya. Hi, Joydeep. That's a wonderful yes. talk. It's, uh, yeah, I have a specific question, if I understand correctly. Say, for example, uh, if I take uh, E plus E minus going to TT bar, now uh, mm -hmm. you can consider that you can have a, a scalar effective operator, right? I mean, uh, and a tensor effective operator. Now, the scalar effective operator can be generated by different kinds of new physics models. Uh, for example, you can think of uh, type 2 uh, CISA models or scotogenic mm -hmm. models or, for example, uh, you know, there are varieties of uh, two Higgs doublet models, which will actually give you to the C plus E minus two TT bar scalar effective operator. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I understood correctly, so is there any way that you are suggesting that? Mm, so, are just you, looking so, at this yeah, so uh, actually, uh, so are you talking about the operators from SMIP or below SMIP, below standard model? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm assuming that the new physics scale is heavy enough so that at e plus e minus to tt bar, I'm, I'm looking for. Yeah. I'm talking uh, about uh, experimental. Uh, yeah. Anna, my question is: Are you talking about the operators that belong to the SMIFT? Because there's another operator set which is called the low energy effective phase field depth, which where you are integrating out the Higgs gauge bosons and so on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking into the uh, low energy uh, incarnation of these new physics models, which gives yeah. rise to this effective operator scenario. Yes. So, for example, I'm interested in a specific kind of experiments, like I want to produce TT bar at future E plus E minus experiments. So I have the standard model uh, predictions. And on top of that, I have this heavy uh, effective operator contributions to this particular process like E plus E minus 2 TT. Okay, okay. So what you can do actually, 
so you know, first identify what is your energy effective field three operator. Okay. So okay. now, now, now there are so many papers actually that we have written also one paper. So this energy effective field three operator have a actually mapping in the SNET. And this mapping is not unique. That means basically there are multiple and operators of different dimensions from the SNET can give offer you the same left operator. Okay. So you have to identify that. And once you identify that, then from the SNET to UV theory is much more easier. Yeah, well, I, my question was specifically that suppose I take different kinds of uh, uh, models which predicts, uh, uh, you know, uh, additional Higgses which are present beyond the standard model. <laughs> and say, for example, you consider type 2 uh, CISA models or, <laughs> you know, you consider uh, um, a scotogenic model, which all gives you, you know, has to incorporate this additional Higgses basically. Now, yeah. uh, what I'm trying to say that in uh, both these cases, if you integrate uh, and if you assume that those heavy Higgses are beyond the scale of uh, ILC to probe uh, at whatever center of mass energy 250 GeV that they are operating on, so they will show up in the E plus E minus to TT bar in terms of this effective scalar operators, say for example. But there are a bunch of new physics which actually contributes to the same um, uh, same process. Uh, I mean to say. So uh, uh, my question was specifically that: Are you somehow suggesting that there are observables that I can also cook up where just looking into this effective operator? Yes. Uh, procedure of E plus E minus to TT bar, I can distinguish whether this is the type 2 CISO model or, you know, um, yes, yes. Some, yes. some other. Uh, so this was basically my question. So, because, so, so, uh, so, so that's why actually you can see. So let's say, forget about the, what is written here. Okay. So you have chosen your observers. Okay. So now these observers are being affected by the which set of operators and that operators belong to which models they will be different. Okay, so that's why just just a particular observable is not sufficient. You cannot break the degeneracy that you can see here. So that, that right. But once you put all of them side by side, that means if you are passing through all the observers, then you can see the level of degeneracy has been broken so much. Okay, okay. So for example, uh, Jadi, could you remind me what was this adops and DLV that? Okay, so adops are basically the additional operators which are uh, which do not belong to. I would say any uh, particular, you know, uh, okay, they, not, so they are the new operators being generated, but you cannot dump them in this category. So that's why I call them ad additional operators until you come up with a new observable which actually being affected by these operators. I see. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, maybe uh, we uh, we yeah. discuss more. But thanks. Thanks a lot. Rintu, uh, can you please go ahead and ask? Thank you. Yeah, so my question was that uh, you are, uh, as you make that uh, BSM symmetry is also standard model. Now, if you, your BSM symmetry is like some higher symmetries, higher base symmetry, I mean, then you can actually uh, filter those, uh, uh, those uh, observable further, like there will be some operators which will be protected by higher symmetry, or maybe that could actually, that will be protected by higher symmetry, but that could generate by IRG or some kind of loop level. Is that that that? that so, yeah, so, yeah. So first of all, when we uh, when we are showing this thing, we are actually ignoring the running of those uh, operators. Okay. Uh, and second point, if you have, for example, if you have a left-right symmetry, okay. Yeah. So then what you have to do actually, you have to perform the breaking of the left-right symmetry first. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then because then only your non-standard model gauge bosons, like I mean, the right wing gauge, the right wing gauge bosons, and the other the scalars and all those things are basically heavy. Okay, and then you integrate them out. So basically, if you have a standard gas symmetry, you break that, and then you integrate out because then you come up with the standard because then you get a subset of the snake. Uh, again, again, my my question is: see, some there will be some operators which are possible at the level of standard model symmetry, but mm -hmm. they may not be possible at the BSM symmetry, and that uh, that. Uh, uh, Wilson coefficient may be like protected and couldn't, couldn't be generated uh, like in the standard model. That's why, uh, that's why I said that you will get only a subset, not all of them. Yeah, within that subset, uh, within I, I'm saying that there, uh, there will be some uh, 
operators that so, so you are saying that okay, so you are saying basically if let's say for example if i have a complex chip that instead of type 2 so if i say that complex chip is coming from reference yes, material yes 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 so because that is more convoluted stuff yeah so it will be guided by the what kind of interactions it has and as you know this more symmetry is basically more constant right so it yes. has more correlations yes that's yes. true yes okay thank you okay i can see no more raised hands so i want to thank you again for this wonderful talk and uh, we can go ahead to the next speaker you can unshare okay. okay so our next speaker is dr faiz abu azami from isc bangalore and uh, he will talk about uh, bsm hicks yukawa couplings so dr azami if you can yeah share this yes please go ahead yeah thank you for giving me this opportunity uh so i'm going to uh give a brief talk about uh the beyond the standard model higgs yukawa couplings uh this is based on work i did with sudhir vampati in addition to previous work with uh, these guys here so um this talk is actually related to the previous one in, uh, in that it's an, as a uh, an effective field theory, except that it's an effective field theory, theory from a different point of view. So first I will discuss the framework of our EFT, then we'll show how to apply this to the G minus two anomaly, and then uh, try to extend this to the flavor violation in the Higgs sector. So, uh, uh, the current measurements of the Higgs couplings to the standard model particles leave ample room for uh, physics beyond the standard model. For example, the Higgs coupling to the top quark is only constrained at an order of 20%, whereas to the muon, it's order 50%. Couplings to higher order operators uh, are either not constrained at all or even less constrained. This motivates us to uh, write a phenomenological bottom-up EFT uh, to search for physics beyond the standard model. For example, in the Yukawa uh, sector, we extend the standard model as such, where here uh, we write the uh, deviation in the uh, standard model Yukawa coupling uh, as delta F1. Uh, and we write the uh, other Yukawa-like couplings uh, or higher order Yukawa-like couplings as such. Uh, this is reminiscent of SMIFT uh, from the previous talk, except that this is more phenomenological. And here we are not talking about an expansion scale, but we're just talking about uh, deviations compared to the standard model. Uh, one can show that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this uh, approach and the standard model effective field theory. Uh, if you use a certain uh, level of truncation, for example, you can map this to dimension six SMIFT operators and so on and so forth. However, this is more phenomenologically transparent because in, the, in, in uh, the LHC, you're not measuring any expansion scale. You're really measuring these deviations and Wilson coefficients. So with this in hand, we would like to uh, see some applications uh, into how these can still uh, show us where we can find new physics. So the first application is solving the G minus two anomaly. Now, as you all know, uh, last year, Fermilab confirmed the existence of uh, the muon uh, or uh, deviation of the muon magnetic dipole moment compared to the standard model prediction with a significance of 4.2 sigma. Now, of course, some of you know that there are two lattice groups that dispute this. However, um, it seems like most uh, results point to the existence of this anomaly. Now, in the standard model, the one loop Higgs contribution is only 10 to the power minus 14 and is negligible. However, if we allow for deviations compared to the standard model, this contribution is enhanced. So the question is, can the Higgs itself, given a standard model or an EFT uh, framework, can, can it still account for this uh, discrepancy? So using the previous Lagrangian, we just use the EFT uh, with this, uh, we, we truncate at uh, the next leading operator. Here, delta mu one, um, the deviation of the Yukawa coupling in the mu one sector and C mu two is the Yukawa like uh, deviation. Uh, writing down the uh, relevant diagrams, here we have these five diagrams. The uh, first two are uh, bar Z type, uh, contributions you can see here you have enhancement in the in the z through delta z uh, delta w uh, mu one uh, the second one 
is a unique, the second, third, and fourth are actually unique because you allow for CMU2, so this is an effective field coupling. And you can calculate this, uh, these contributions with an effective uh, Lagrangian, uh, the, previously with a cutoff scale. Uh, the first contribution comes from the third diagram right here. Uh, the second contribution arises from these two diagrams, four and five, uh, as uh, the last diagram, the, or number one and two, were calculated in the, in the standard model in the literature, so you just rescale them by delta mu. Notice here that in the standard model limit, delta mu and the c's are zero, so the Higgs doesn't contribute beyond. So this essentially parameterizes your deviations versus delta mu. So you can plot this and see whether you can still solve the G minus two anomaly. So here is the parameter space and uh, we plot C mu two versus the delta mu two. And we superimpose the LHC bound here in the solid red. Uh, as about, you can see here, we can still solve delta, uh, uh, the uh, ma magnetic double moment anomaly of the mu one, given the current level of experimental constraints. Uh, of course, here, the LHC bound is, on delta mu one is plus or minus 0.53 in the Kappa framework. CMU2 is unconstrained, and this is why you essentially can formulate uh, or you can furnish a solution to the G minus two. Notice when delta mu one is zero, you can still account for the solution for the G minus two. And this is because uh, CMU is, uh, is not measured. The reverse is not true. That is CMU2 on itself is not sufficient to account for uh, this measurement. Uh, here we'll also superimpose uh, the high luminosity uh, uh, LHC run, the projections thereof, and the projections from the muon collider, which essentially is expected to probe the entire range for delta mu one. Now, what are the phenomenological implications of having non-zero uh, deviations? Well, when you, the, when you have uh, deviations compared to the standard model, you're gonna have the standard model Higgs being UV incomplete. The reason for this is that the standard model is the only UV complete theory with the observed particle content, and any deviations compared to the standard model predictions will make it UV incomplete. This UV incompletion will manifest itself as processes with energy growing amplitudes that eventually unita violate unitarity, as Rohini explained to us in uh, the chat previously. And this will signal the onset of new physics. What this means is that each point in uh, the parameter space here will correspond to a scale of new physics that is unique and can be probed in colliders. So we, uh, based on the previous talk that I, uh, we did for the top sector here, we can adapt this to the case of the mu one, and there's only one model independent bound through mu mu bar to a uh, di Higgs. Uh, this process essentially gives us a unitarity violating scale through partial wave unitarity given by this expression right here. And as you can see, when you have deviations that are finite, then you, this would lead to a certain uh, level of Emax. When uh, this deviation vanishes, essentially Emax goes to infinity, which tells you that you retrieve the standard model limit. So uh, the model independent bound can be uh, shown here. This corresponds to the uh, region in the parameter space that can solve the G minus two anomaly. And it ranges between 10 to 12 uh, to 18 TV, which is beyond what can be uh, probed in either the uh, LHC or the high luminosity LHC. However, we can obtain better bounds if we consider processes that involve the longitudinal modes of W and Z, and if we insist that they confirm to the standard model. That is because uh, these processes right here are receive contamination from uh, to the contributions of the uh, Higgs for coupling to W and Z. They're not truly model independent because they will depend on uh, HWW and HZZ. However, if those are assumed to confirm to the standard model uh, predictions, then uh, we can obtain these model independent bound uh, and the bound on the scale of no physics can be lowered to between four and five TeV, which is within the reach of the high luminosity run of the LHC. Another interesting fact uh, that uh, can uh, result as a non-zero delta mu one or CMU two is the enhancement of the Higgs reduction. 
Now, in PP colliders, then this enhancement will come through muon fusion with the muon running through the loop uh, as such. However, explicit calculation will show that these are negligible because of the smallness of the Yukawa coupling. Uh, however, if one considers the proposed mu one collider, then through mu mu bar to a dihyd production, one can have a significant production through the contact term because now C mu two is allowed to be to be non-vanishing, and it's easy to show that uh, the tree level cross section is actually significant. Here we plot the cross section that, uh, and we superimpose the region in the parameter space that corresponds to G minus two. And we can show that uh, there's actually significant uh, cross section that ranges between seven and 23 pico pico barn, which is quite significant and gives further motivation for uh, building the haluminosity or uh, the muon collider. So uh, furthermore, uh, this uh, represents the first uh, work that I did with, with it here uh, a month ago. And now uh, we can also use the same um, kind of phenomenological Lagrangian in order to generate to generalize to um, effective Lagrangians, including flavor violation. We can essentially do this by uh, writing this Lagrangian and promoting YIJ and CIJ to become uh, matrices that might be non-diagonal. Uh, here, uh, these will parameterize the flavor violation. Previously, uh, flavor violation through um, non-diagonal YIJ has been studied extensively. However, for the first time, we allow for non-minimal uh, violation in the Yukawa coupling uh, um, uh, CIJ. So in our uh, 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 investigation, we set YIJ to be standard model, and we focus on flavor violation from CIJ like this. Now, this is work in progress. Uh, currently, we are, we are we finished uh, doing the muon, um, uh, constraining the muon or the lepton sector. Uh, for example, here we can have a constraint from the decay of a lepton to lepton plus gamma, such as tau to mu gamma, tau to e gamma, or mu to e gamma. This proceeds through uh, the two loop diagram like this with either tau, mu, or e running in the loop. Uh, the one loop diagram is vanishing and we can furnish here the following uh, um, uh, constraints uh, that come, each, each set comes from a different particle running from another loop. As you can see here, we can essentially furnish some stringent constraints. And for the first time, to the best of our knowledge, uh, these constraints were pre pre calculated in the literature. Uh, we can also uh, constrain, uh, constrain these through the decay of leptons to three other leptons. Uh, for example, tau to three mu, tau to three e, or mu to three e, in addition to mixed uh, decays. Those proceed through uh, one loop like this, and we can furnish these constraints uh, on these uh, couplings as, as well. Um, other constraints uh, uh, do exist, but they are not as strong as these. And what remains is to extend this treatment to the quark sector, which is still being uh, being done. So I'll be brief. Uh, let me conclude here by saying that the key takeaway here is that the Higgs sector compare, remains of prime location for searching for physics beyond the standard model. This is because the current uh, constraint um, uh, on the Higgs couplings to the rest of the standard model, particularly the Yukawa and Yukawa-like couplings, leaves ample room for physics beyond the standard model. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to look into the, uh, the uh, coupling or the effective coupling CMU2 because it can still accommodate for a solution to the G minus uh, two. This solution will correspond to uh, a conservative scale of new physics that ranges between 10 to 18 TeV which can be lowered to 5 TeV if the Higgs coupling to the massive gauge bosons is standard model-like. Uh, flavor violation could arise now minimally through CIJ, and we advocate this uh, to be investigated. The key takeaway of this study is that uh, the couplings CMU I or CMU2 needs more interest uh, in the literature. To the best of our knowledge, no current or future experiments uh, propose measuring CMU2. Uh, they do so for C, for the top quark, C top two, which is uh, currently constrained at about plus or minus 20%. However, we think that we need more uh, similar um, uh, similar interest uh, on CMU2 as well. 
So with this, let me uh, conclude my talk and keep it brief and see if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Adhara, for the very nice talk. Yeah, if anybody has any question, then please go ahead. I don't see any raised hand. So let me ask one question. So uh, why do we get better bounce in uh, muon colliders? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the reason for this, if, if you have a muon collider, uh, let me get back to here. Uh, for uh, PP colliders, what you will have is that the dihex enhancement will come through uh, these diagrams with the, uh, the muon going through the loop. Now, of course, this is dominated by the top fork and the muon collider or muon coupling is small. So you won't get, you get a negligible uh, contribution. However, for if you have a muon collider indeed, you will have uh, this process mu mu bar to H H bar proceeding through a contact term. And because C mu two is unconstrained, uh, essentially it can have a sizable, uh, sizable value as uh, compared to the deviations in the Yukawa couplings, you can have a large uh, uh, enhancement of the dihigs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, if nobody has any question, then let's thank Dr. Ajame again for the very wonderful talk. And let's go ahead to the next speaker. Yes, so our next next speaker is Ritoja Shane Gupta from ISC Bangalore. And uh, she will talk about light neutralino dark matter in MSSM contributing to Higgs invisible decay. So Ritoja, please go ahead. Hello, uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Ritoja Shingupto and I'm very grateful uh, to have this opportunity to present our work uh, in front of you. I'll be talking about light neutrally no dark matter in MSSM contributing to the Higgs invisible decay, uh, which is based on this uh, recent work done in collaboration with Dr. Rahul Kumar Bormun, Professor Genevieve Belanger, Professor Bipla Bhattacharjee and Professor Rohini Godbole. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, we all know that the standard model of particle physics, which is very successful in explaining many fundamental phenomena of particles, is very well tested at the quantum level by the precision measurements. And with the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012, the last piece of the standard model was found. However, there are still many unanswered questions like the origin of neutrino masses, dark matter, matter-antimatter asymmetry, and no conclusive hint of new physics as of yet. So we asked the question, can Higgs boson be the messenger of new physics? So what do we mean by this uh, is that uh, the Higgs is acting as a connection of new physics particles to the standard model. So new physics particles have coupling to the standard model Higgs boson and through that they couple to our standard model particles. And this is uh, motivated both theoretically as well as experimentally. Now, these new particles can be dark matter. And uh, there will be a talk by Professor Shubhadito Bhattacharya uh, talking about how to probe dark matter through the Higgs portal. But in this talk, what we are talking about is uh, what can, I mean, how can we get the invisible decay of the Higgs boson? Now, if our dark matter particle is lighter than half the Higgs boson mass, then this dark matter can be produced from the on-shell decay of the standard model Higgs boson. And this is basically the invisible decay of the Higgs boson. So one possible dark matter candidate is the lightest neutralino in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, MSSM. And so uh, before uh, proceeding further, let us understand what, the, what we mean by lightest neutralino in the MSSM. Uh, just uh, some basic stuff. So from extending standard model to MSSM, we have two Higgs doublets in the MSSM Higgs sector, and that gives us five Higgs bosons instead of the one Higgs boson in the standard model. Here, the lightest CP even Higgs, which is denoted by this small h, uh, is our standard, I mean, the observed Higgs boson. 
And in the supersymmetry, uh, so for every corresponding Weyl fermion, uh, we have a super partner, which is a complex scalar and vice versa. And uh, for each gauge boson, we also have a Weyl fermion. So if we look at the standard model particles that we have, so for every fermions, we will have a scalar fermion uh, as the super partner. For Higgs bosons, we'll have Higgs zenos, and for gauge bosons, we'll have gauge zenos. Now with this information, let us look at the electroweak Eno sector. Uh, and uh, we look at the super partners of the uh, electroweak gauge bosons and the Higgs bosons. So we have the Bino, the Vino, and the two Higgs zenos. So uh, they have four neutral, comp uh, neutral uh, gauge zenos. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, two neutral gauginos and two uh, neutral hexinos and uh, four, uh, I mean, uh, two charged and uh, I mean, four charged uh, inos. So they mix together to give you four neutral inos and four charge inos, and these are mass ordered. So the lightest neutral ino is the um, uh, neutral ino uh, coming from the mixing of these four uh, uh, inos, and uh, this has the light, uh, this has the lowest mass. So now, uh, if Susie had been ex, uh, exact, then the super partners would have the same mass at this as their standard model counterparts. But we know that Susie is broken, and therefore all the super partner masses are parameters of the MSSM. And if we have R parity conserving Susie, then the lightest supersymmetric particle, uh, which we call the LSP, will be stable. So if this LSP is neutral, then it can be a dark matter uh, candidate. So this talk, uh, we are focusing on uh, lightest neutralino, uh, which we uh, discussed uh, what we mean by lightest neutralino a couple of slides below, uh, before, uh, is our LSP. And uh, since it's uh, neutral, it is also a viable dark matter candidate. And since we are interested to look at the Higgs invisible decay, its uh, mass is less than half the Higgs boson mass, that is around 62.5 GeV. Now, this scenario has been uh, previously studied in many works, uh, but this has particularly become interesting uh, now uh, because we have new data at our disposal and it, run three is also coming up. So uh, we uh, a fresh look at this scenario is much needed to understand whether uh, what's the current status. So this is the MSSM parameter space uh, where, uh, so we, uh, so these are all the parameters that we scan over where M1 is the Bino mass, M2 is the Vino mass, Mu is the Higgsino mass parameter and it can have both the positive and negative signs and we have studied them separately. Tan beta is the ratio of the webs, MA the pseudoscalar mass and these here, um, this, uh, uh, Side uh, parameter, uh, they uh, uh, the linear plane and M3 minus. So we scan over these and uh, uh, discussed uh, earlier that our light neutral Lino to be below 62.5 GeV, it has to be dominantly Bino due to lep limit on charge Eno mass. Now the coupling of this LSP to the Z and Higgs bosons depend on the Bino, Vino and Higgs Zeno components in it. So here, these are the two equations. The two equations here show the coupling of this chi one zero to your Z boson and the Higgs boson. And you can see that these depend on this N13, N14, N12, and N11, which are basically the mixing, um, ma mixing matrix components. So the next question is, what will be our, our next to lightest supersymmetric particle, which we call the NLSP? And in this uh, study, we have mostly considered Higgsino due to the already existing strong limits on Vino NLSP. So now, uh, uh, so uh, we have used fine Higgs as our particle spectrum generator. And moving on, so we can see uh, this is a large parameter space and now we already have some existing uh, constraints uh, which uh, play which will play a role in constraining our parameter space and um, giving us results so the first one is of course the lep constraints which include the invisible decay of z boson from new physics then the chargino mass limit which um, is uh, i mean your chargino has to be greater than 103 gv and then some cross section of associated production of neutralinos in final states with jets the second set of constraints that we apply on our parameter space 
are the flavor observable are constraints on the flavor observables so these are rare processes in the standard model like this fcnc flavor changing neutral current process like b2s gamma which uh, proceeds through loop in standard model and it will receive contribution from the mssm and therefore precise measurement of the branching of these processes constrain the mssm parameter space and we have here applied these constraints and then the next and the a very important set of constraints come from the higgs constraints so we have already discussed that out of the five higgs bosons which we get from the mssm uh, in the mssm the lightest cp even uh, state uh, we uh, we as uh, we uh, uh, we think that the, that is the our observed uh, higgs boson and therefore its mass should be around 125 gv but there are theoretical uncertainties so being conservative we if our mssm uh, parameters uh, can give us a higgs mass between 122 to 128 gv we um, uh, take that point then the sec second set is the higgs signal strength so already lhc has observed Higgs in a number of uh, production modes, as well as it has measured different branching modes of the Higgs and comparing them with your theoretical expectations, you, you can calculate this Higgs signal strengths and see whether your MSSM parameters uh, do not uh, change this uh, signal strength observables very much. Then there are heavy Higgs searches. So our MSSM param, uh, MSSM's Higgs sector uh, has heavy Higgses and you can look for their decay uh, in the uh, in the uh, large hadron collider and search for them and then place limits uh, uh, from the non observation of any events and this here actually excludes a large chunk of the parameter space here in this plot the x axis is the pseudo scalar mass ma and the y axis is the tan beta and you can see that this large region uh, i mean low tan beta uh, i mean high tan beta for low ma is ruled out by this atlas analysis and then we have the invisible decay of the Higgs boson. So our Higgs boson can decay to chi 0, chi 0, and the branching of such process has to be less than 14.5%, uh, which comes from this uh, recent ATLAS analysis using the VBF topology. Now our chi 0 is a dark matter candidate as well, so it has to satisfy dark matter constraints. The first one being the relic density. So the present observed relic density of dark matter from the Planck collaboration is around 0.12 uh, with an error bar of 0.001. And within two sigma, we uh, demand that our LSP's uh, relic density should be less than uh, uh, 0.122. And this is, and if it's underabundant, then dark matter can be multi-component. Then there are direct detection, uh, uh, direct detection constraints, which constrain the uh, dark matter and nucleon cross section. Uh, in this plot, that y axis is the WIMP nucleon cross section, and the x axis is the dark matter mass. Uh, and uh, there are many experiments constraining uh, this. And you have used both spin independent limits and spin dependent limits. And uh, you have to scale this direct detection cross section with this factor J, which is uh, basically the uh, factor of relic density that it is satisfying. So if it's underabundant, then then limits will be become weaker, and then you have to scale your sigma direct detection accordingly. So now uh, the last set of constraints is the electroweak eno constraints. So these are results of direct searches of chargino and neutralino at the ATLAS and CMS experiments of the LHC. So we are talking about processes where we produce this um, charge genu neutralino pairs and uh, they will decay to W boson and neutralino one or Z and Higgs boson and neutralino one. And neutralino one being the dark matter candidate, it will leave a missing transverse energy signature in our collection. Along with that, uh, the modes of these uh, vector bosons and the Higgs, uh, since they are cleaner, they have been used in the past and there are, uh, I mean, conventional analysis of three lepton plus missing uh, uh, which are being done to uh, constrain this, uh, these uh, charging bosons. You have five minutes long. Okay, sure. Uh, but uh, since these have low branching, uh, therefore they are sensitive to lighter NLSPs. Uh, but recently, uh, both ATLAS and CMS uh, experiments have uh, actually uh, analyzed the hadronic final states, and these increase sensitivity to heavier NLSPs. So if you look at this plot, this uh, x-axis is this um, 
Chargino or second neutralino mass, I mean your NLSP mass and the y-axis is your dark matter, I mean this LSP mass. And you can see that this can exclude up to 900 GeV of NLSP, whereas from leptonic final states, you can only go up to 400 GeV. So we have implemented these uh, electroweak constraints using SMODELS. Now the results for positive mu scenario, uh, this is what we have found. And the x-axis is the dark matter mass, the LSP mass. Y-axis is the direct detection cross-section scaled with its relic density. And here all the gray points are uh, satisfy all the constraints from lab flavor, Higgs constraints, relic density, and direct detection experiments like Xenon 110, Pico 60, and Panda X40. And the colored points, they satisfy all the electro constraints from the LHC. And here we can make three, comment, uh, me, three observations. The first one is that relic density and direct detection allows points only in the Z and Higgs funnel regions where the mass of the Kaiven zero lies within some half of Z uh, boson mass and half of Higgs boson mass. Second one is you, after applying this electroweak window constraints, the colored points, I mean, the Z funnel is completely ruled out, but in the Higgs funnel, you either have very light uh, Higgs zeros uh, around 150 GeV or very heavy, or heavy Higgs zeros uh, above 855 GeV. But if you uh, apply this LZ limit, which is, which is very recently given by this LZ collaboration with uh, 60 days of data, this completely rules out the positive mu scenario. So what happens in the negative mu scenario? So here, uh, the first plot is, the, uh, is similar to what we have seen for the positive mu, only that here the y-axis shows a spin-dependent new uh, direct detection cross-sections. And here we see that we have points in both the Z and Higgs funnel regions, which satisfy all the constraints. But once we apply the LZ limit, again, in the spin independent direct detection, uh, the heavier masses in the Higgs funnel region gets ruled out and only a very narrow uh, marginally allowed region is left, which is light. And these will be, these are very marginally uh, allowed. So these are expected to be probed in the near future by the LZ experiment with its full thousand day exposure. And this is again the uh, result for mu less than zero. Uh, the negative mu scenario, but in a different, um, the y-axis uh, here shows the NLSP mass, so the neutralino 2 mass, and here these stars are all the points which satisfy all the constraints, and we see that um, they are mostly very light, uh, light Higgs zeros. So this inset plot shows how, uh, I mean, how far are they from getting probed in our colliders. So this is this model's R value, and a smaller R value indicates that the point lies way outside the current limit or current analysis, and a R value close to one indicates that it just lies on the border. And we see from this insert point that some of our points have very small values of R. And these are basically getting, I mean, evading ATLAS searches for charginos and neutralinos in the leptonic final states, uh, since these are very light uh, Higgs zeros, so uh, leptonic final states are more uh, effective in probing that. And for that, we performed an analysis with the leptonic final states using XGBoost. And our results show that these actually, these points, this narrow region that is getting, uh, that is evading all the current constraints could be probed with upcoming analysis of the run two data, which have not yet been implemented in this model. So just to reiterate that we are using this models framework. So any analysis that is not included in models won't uh, be, I mean, the results are not here. So models actually is, this is the latest version. So it includes all the published uh, results, but uh, yes, we should keep an eye for the, any new results. Or if run two is not able, run three will definitely be able to look into this narrow region, provided the systematic uncertainties can be brought under control, because we have seen that systematic uncertainties in this narrow region plays a crucial role. So just my concluding remarks that the recent results from the electroweakino searches at the LHC and the LC dark matter direct detection experiments have severely constrained the positive mu scenario. And it has squeezed the parameter space to light hexenos in the negative mu scenario for a light neutralino thermal dark matter in the MSSM, which can uh, which is lighter than half the Higgs boson mass. And the run three of LHC can target this low mass hexenos, and dedicated analysis might close this narrow gap. So this is this is also a menu for the run three that they can devise their analysis in such a way that this uh, whatever 
uh, region is left out, that can also be uh, probed. So to, uh, at present, we are at a very exciting juncture where the experiments lined up might just include the possibility of a light neutralino thermal dark matter in the MSSM altogether, or we might be very close to start observing the first hints of new physics. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rikita, for a very interesting talk. Uh, if anybody has any question, please go ahead. Yes, Professor Sudhir. Uh, hi, Rikita. Uh, how low can be this light Higgs signals be? Meaning, it's there. What is the lower limit? Yeah. So the lower limit. Uh, I mean, we have found points uh, from around uh, one forty-five to. I mean, yeah, 149 to 155 GB. So this is basically the very narrow region where uh, it becomes the decay is off shell. So the off shell analysis, uh, I mean, yeah, so this is double. Uh, when you say hexino, you mean pure hexino? This Z. I think her, her internet is slightly unstable. Can you please repeat? Yes. Right. Uh, when you say Higgsino, uh, around uh, these are in the Higgs funnel and in the Z funnel around 130 to 140 GeV. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, when you say here Higgsino, uh, is it pure Higgsino? How much is the Higgsino component? Yeah, it's uh, mostly, I mean, uh, so here uh, our Bino is at, so our, uh, we have started our Vino scan from around 1 TV. So, and our Higgsinos are around 130 GV. So it, they are more, I mean, dominantly Higgsino, uh, but they will have some admixture, uh, slight admixture, but yeah, they are mostly uh, Higgsino, like, I mean, almost uh, pure Higgsinos because the Bino is at uh, below 60 GV. So the Bino is, uh, I mean, the Chi 1 0 is more uh, dominantly Bino and it has a slight Higgsino admixture. And then the NLSP is your Higgsino and your Vino is sitting above 1 TV. So okay. these are. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Can so I just add one comment? Yeah. LSP is uh, Bino, completely Bino. Can I, can I just add one comment? Because internet is not working, I guess. Um, what was your question? Uh, what was your question, Sudhir? Uh, so Rituja is here. I am giving her my microphone. You can talk to her. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, so what is the question? I don't know why Sudhir may not be able to speak, but what he was asking Ritaja was about the Higgsino Bino content uh, of the uh, LSP and NLSP. Yeah. And uh, that was, at, at least I understood that question about uh, that. It yes. Was about yes. So uh, LSP is dominantly Bino, so around 19, I mean, around 99%, I mean, greater than 95%, it's almost, uh, it has the Bino component, and the rest is Higgsy. Uh, sorry, one one comment, uh, Ridaya. Uh, have, yes. you, have you checked the recent result from the Higgsino searches? Because this, the, uh, the limit, as far as I remember, for the simplified models are at least uh, greater than 300 or 400 GV. Like, yes, you, so uh, we are, uh, yeah. change the limit? Yeah. Hmm. So we are uh, so we are using the latest version of Smallest, which includes all the uh, latest results. I mean, all the one thirty nine, fifty one inverse results of 
uh, Atlas and CMS. And these points, I mean, so we are having, I mean, so around, so in the simplified scenario, uh, your uh, limit excludes still 400 GV uh, or so for hexenos. But in the very light region, I mean, this branching, I mean, for so that is the simplified case. And here for each particle spectrum, Swanis is calculating the branching ratios and then uh, checking with the efficiency maps. So here we are getting this very low, I mean, very narrow region at the light hexenos, uh, which are allowed. But there, as you can see, I mean, uh, not able to show my slides, but these are evading some Atlas result, which is which was about 20.3 from the one inverse. So that was some dedicated off uh, analysis, but uh, we don't know whether uh, some, uh, I mean, if you update that analysis, what uh, will be the result here. But we have that 139 from the one inverse leptonic analysis in this list. So in the Z and the H funnel regions, these are still allowed with this range of uh, you see now you consider for your yes. model. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. For our model, in the positive view, it's mostly getting rolled out due to the recent NC limit. But in the negative view, we are still having these narrow, uh, I mean, which these points in the very narrow region at light pixels around 150 G. Okay. I think you can point, you said that in your talk, Ritaja, but maybe yes. you can emphasize it once again that those particular points that are allowed are due to the mass relations between the different uh, uh, NLSP and LSP, which uh, allows the, this uh, points to evade the searches. Yes, yes. So I think perhaps you can emphasize. You said it very clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So these are, I mean, the mass difference, I mean, the mark of the hexino, I mean, the NLSP and LSP such that the, your W, I mean, your Z and Higgs bosons are produced off-fill and you are looking at the off-fill So that is, I mean, uh, I mean, it needs some dedicated analysis and uh, the branching ratios will also suffer, I mean, uh, due to such symptoms. So that's why these are getting Professor Ghosh, if you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, so, hi, this is a nice talk. So, just a uh, naive doubt. So, your slipton masses were around 2 TV. So, what yes. about the G minus 2 constraint? Yeah, so we, we tried looking at that, but uh, the thing is, in our positive, our positive view scenario here is, I mean, even if we keep the slipton stick up, it's getting ruled out from this uh, LZ limit. The positive view is the one which actually will. Um, I mean, uh, uh, favor the muon G minus two anomaly, and uh, and before the LZ limit, we were actually getting points which could satisfy the muon G minus two, where we were bringing the sleptons down, and we were trying different kinds of things where we keep the sleptons right, uh, and also uh, I mean we bring the muon uh, below. Uh, above, I think the current limit is around 700 GeV. So we were keeping it just above 700 GeV or, and we were also trying some things, uh, I mean, how we can keep it below 700 GeV with different uh, possible spectrum such that it doesn't uh, uh, get ruled out by the current uh, electromolecular limits. But the point is that the positive mu in this funnel regions, uh, in the Higgs and Z funnels, is getting ruled out due to uh, the LZ. Okay, so uh, another quick question. So could you please yes. comment on this, the fine tuning because some of your squat masses was also around 5 TV. Yes. So um, the issue of the fine tuning uh, in. Uh, sorry, I mean, yes, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So some of the squat masses, I mean, the, for the mm -hmm. first generation, it was around 5 TV, if I remember yes, correctly. Yes, yes. Yes. So what about the fine tuning uh, issues? The parameter tuning and mm -hmm. how sensitive your results to uh, that parameter tuning. So we have, uh, I mean, we have not checked the fine tuning measure. I mean, for quite, I mean, we have uh, all. The, I mean, we are only playing with the third generation squawk masses to ensure that we get the correct uh, Higgs boson mass, and we have decoupled the first two generations from the spectrum. Okay. Uh, May I respond also? 
to Pradeep's yes, yes. question. Yes. See, Pradeepta, I think fine tuning is no less or no more than any other Suzy scenario, but our yes. results are completely insensitive okay. to the squat masses that we are choosing. Okay, okay. None of the experimental signatures we are looking at, or none of the uh, indirect constraints, uh, you know, push our squawk masses beyond the usual fine tuning uh, limits that are in, you know, sort of independent. This analysis is independent of that question. Okay, okay. That's really what I want to emphasize. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, that was no point. more or no less than anybody else who is believing in PMSSM. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the 19 parameter business. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rituja, for the interesting talk. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions. So we can close this session and uh, we will reconvene at 2.15. Thank you, everybody.